everyone i am priyanka chauhan and meril orthopedics welcomes you all to master's course caseathon a global platform for sharing knowledge and recent updates in the field of joint replacement surgeries meril is proud to bring our members together through this webcast and stay connected as well as updated in the times of covid-19 day 1 of master's course caseathon comprises of so three sessions covering topics around hip replacement surgeries Today we are graced with renowned faculties along with eminent session directors from across the globe. Before we start our session one of master's course complexities in complex primary THR, Meril would like to express its pride in welcoming and introducing each of our session directors and faculties and their accomplishments. Can we have the slide, please? Yes, just share. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Uh, Tejas, can you grant me the access? Please check now. Can you see it now? Uh, it is saying your sharing is paused. Not yet, Pinaki. Yeah. So, Pinaki, no issues. I'll share it from yes, my. Yes, you share it from your end. Yeah, that will be fine. I hope Thank it is visible. Yes, yes. Yes, Next slide. Is there. Today we have with us our eminent session director, Dr. Sanket Devanji, consultant joint replacement surgeon, spine and joint clinic, Surat. He has with himself a great bank of knowledge and expertise he has gained through numerous trainings and fellowship programs across the world. He has received award for the best paper presentation at 26th annual meeting of Gujarat Orthopedic Association. Dr. Devanji has 12 paper publications to his accomplishments. Dr. Sanket Devanji, Meril Orthopedics welcomes you to Master's Course Kesathon. Thank you. Hello, everyone. We also have with us, as our session director, Professor Dr. Shakir Kapadia, HOD Department of Orthopedic Saifi Hospital, Mumbai. He has with himself a vast expertise in joint replacement surgeries, shoulder and elbow surgery, pediatric orthopedics, spine surgery musculoskeletal oncology orthopedic trauma hand and foot surgery sport injuries and cartilage restoration professor dr shakir kapadia meril orthopedics welcomes you to master's course caseathon thank you we have with us as faculty dr vinay parashar consultant joint replacement surgeon parix hospital amdavad he has a vast experience including fellowship in robotics arthroplasty from usa he has been a former committee member for ISHKS and Ahmedabad Orthopedic Society. Dr. Vinay Parashat, Meril Orthopedics welcomes you to Master's Course Caseathon. We have with us as faculty, Professor Dr. Milin Kulkarni, Director and Professor at PGI Swastiyo Pratishthan Miraj. Dr. Kulkarni has more than 23 years of experience with special expertise in hip and knee joint replacement surgery, trauma surgery, Elizaro technique, and spine surgery. He has various research papers and publications to his accomplishments. Professor Dr. Milian Kulkarni, Meril Orthopedics, welcomes you to Master's Course Caseathon. We have with us Dr. Ambar Mittal, Consultant Joint Replacement Surgeon, Apollo Hospital, Indore. He has to his credit various international fellowships. He has many research and publications to his accomplishments. Dr. Ambar Mittal, Meril Orthopedics, welcomes you to Master's Course Caseathon. We also have with us Dr. Martin Zimmerman, Senior Scientific Consultant at Ceram Tech, Philippines. 
He has a PhD from Swiss Federal Institute in Technology and more than 25 years of experience in orthopedics. Dr. Martin Zimmerman, Merrill Orthopedics, welcomes you to Master's Course Kesathon. With this, I would request our respected session directors, Dr. Sanket Devanji and Professor Dr. Shakir Kapadia, to kindly take over the session from here. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another course of Master's Course from Merrill. And uh, this time it is going to be a case discussion. Normally it is something else. So without wasting too much time, let me request Dr. Sanket to start with his presentation. Dr. Sanket. Yes. <clears throat> I am uh, trying to open up my presentation. So let me share my screen first. Uh, may I request uh, uh, anyone to start my presentation there? Because uh, yes, sir, I will. I will do that, sir. Just yeah, help him out. Yes, I will, I will try. Hey, just can you make uh, Dr. Sanket co-host? Here? Ah, oh, yes. Okay. Hey, just can you make Dr. Sanket and Dr. Milin co-host? Can you see my screen? Yes, visible, sir. Okay. So, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks, Meryl, for this wonderful opportunity. I wish that everyone is uh, keeping safe in this uh, pandemic. So, I will start this uh, wonderful session on complexities of complex hip with a relatively simple case. A uh, 67-year-old female, she was a known case of rheumatoid arthritis for last 25 years, and she was on regular disease-modifying drugs. She had been complaining of left hip joint pain and difficulty in walking for last two years. Uh, in comorbidity, she had hypertension. On her physical examination, she had tenderness in groin with flex fraction deformity of 20 degree, flexion of 60, abduction 10, adduction 10, external rotation of 20 degree and no internal rotation. So hip was quite stiff. Ipsilateral knee and contralateral hip were good. Her laboratory investigations, including CRP, were within normal limit. So this is the X-ray that we are looking at. 67-year-old rheumatoid arthritis, left hip joint pain. So you can see the X-ray and then we will discuss the complexities in this X-ray. So, uh, I would like to invite comments from audience, like what complexities you've been observing in this X-ray? Do what you have lateral X-ray? Sorry? Lateral view? Do you have? No, we don't have lateral view. Okay. We have pelvis AP X-ray, yeah. Is this hey, do we have heroic? another X-ray prior to this? Do we have another which one which was taken prior to this well, one? This was the X-ray that she presented with. We don't have any previous X-ray as well. Okay. She Is there was, any history of steroids? Yeah, uh, I think she had been taking steroids intermittently, but for last couple of years, she was on disease-modifying drug and she was keeping well. So no steroid in last two years. Okay. So you can uh, see that uh, there is a medial and superior migration of uh, femoral head with uh, a protrusio fracture of uh, medial wall. You can uh, visibly, uh, not visibly make out that it is quite osteoporotic, but uh, if you look at the clearly <laughs> are uh, visible and uh, it seems like osteoporotic. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as I said, there is proximal and medial migration of hip center. So, we are going to face difficulty in dislocation with any other uh, protrusio case. 
Static now lies uh, closer to the femoral uh, shaft and our approach. There is and there are so these are the issues that we are dealing with. So if we discuss about management, what surgical approach is preferable in this case? Like uh, I usually prefer postrolateral approach and uh, I would say that if one, uh, whatever approach one is comfortable with, you can approach this case with uh, either enterolateral or posterior approach. Important consideration is uh, choice of implant. And uh, I would like to ask uh, what implant is preferred, cemented, cementless, any preference in particular for this case? 67 year rheumatoid osteoporotic. I don't know I what everybody that... feels, but uh, normally in osteoporotic bone, we've always thought that we would like to use a cemented implant. Because yes. the cementless implanting time will not integrate and will become loose. Okay. But uh, I mean, I am not always agreeable to this viewpoint because I have personally, even in uh, ankylosing spondylitis and other severe osteoporotic conditions, we are using quite, I mean, we are using cementless implants and we have a reasonably good record, you know. So just, I think maybe, I, I mean, I accept why your, your question is perfectly justified, but Theoretically, it would be better to be doing a cemented implant, but I would not really say that I will minus a cementless implant from my mind at all. Yes, sir. I don't know, Sanket, what is your opinion? Yes, sir. I agree with you. Uh, any sp any uh, uh, change in plan, if we see a medial wall fracture when we use cemented uh, implant, like uh, are you worried about cement uh, extrusion yes. from medial wall or something like that? Or you, you have a CT. Okay. CT scan should be done. Uh, sorry, we have not uh, done the CT scan, but uh, that is a good point that uh, whenever you are seeing a wall fracture, you should further evaluate it with uh, CT scan. Anybody would like to use a protrusio cage or something like that uh, or any view on uh, that uh, implant in present case scenario? Actually, I'm not very sure. I'm sorry, I'm not very sure about the medial wall fracture there. Maybe it just looks like that because of the osteoporosis, you know? Yes. Maybe one of those lines of osteopenia that you can see, which you might think is a fracture. Okay. And what Dr. Millen said would make sense. Just do a CP so you're sure you don't land up with any sticky position when you're operating. That's perfectly uh, a valid point, sir. And uh, lastly, uh, bone grafting should be in consideration. And uh, in this case, we have the native femoral head. So if at all we feel that the bone graft is required, we can always get some bone from the femoral head. You will need bone graft. You will definitely need bone graft. I think because I have a protrusio there, so I think possibly bone grafting should be, I mean, Mandatory. will be required. Okay. So, Sanket bhai, no CT scan. So do you have other pelvic views, inlet, outlet views in this? Uh, I think we get the inlet and outlet Use of, I mean, not inlet and outlet, but oblique use of uh, acetabulum. But uh, unfortunately, I have not, uh, I have not included those views in this. But they were not showing any uh, uh, discontinuity in uh, columns. So I think it won't make any change in the plan. So now let me come out with this uh, post-operative X-ray, and uh, this is what I did. I did a cementless uh, pinnacle cup along with a corel stem ceramic on poly articulation. So, uh, as uh, Dr. Kapadia sir made uh, made the point, it was not really a fracture, but uh, the the wall was definitely kind of uh, fibrotic and uh, it has protruded inside. So. There, there was a gap, but there was not a particular fracture if uh, to, to name so. And uh, we used the slurry that we got from the peripheral reaming. I did not use any uh, cancellous bone graft to feel the defect. And uh, this is the picture. 
I think it is a nice thing you have used something like a press fit principle without building up the floor of the hip. That also is acceptable because this sitting quite nicely and a press fit cup incorporation is a lot of time more better than when you put a bone graft and get your hip center down. In the long run, I mean, we have tried to get the hip center down in a lot of people, but a lot of times the large press fit is a better thing. It heals much faster and incorporates also extremely well. Yes, we we made sure that Dylan, we, anybody, Doctor yeah. Vinay, any comments? Uh, well, sir, honestly speaking, uh, uh, I've burned my hands at uh, one of these cases which I uh, presented probably a couple of months back in Ish, and I went in did something like this, and uh, three weeks later the patient comes in with the cup inside the cavity. Uh -oh. So okay. Uh, my mistake was the same. I did not get a CT scan done. I thought I will go ahead and do an anterior and posterior column. And I really ended up burning my hands on that. So that is why I was more insistent whether we have a CT scan done or not. That that probably, even if you think uh, that it's just a flake or, you know, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. A CT scan is just a 4,000 rupee investigation which will, you know, solve, make the surgeon's life really easy on table. So, Vinay, I would like to ask, like, uh, uh, in your case, when you put the cup in, how was the stability? Like, it, oh, did you it was amazing. It was very good. If you see the immediate post-op x-ray, it was beautiful. And you're like, oh, we are all sorted. So, we thought we'll do guarded weight-bearing, uh, not allow the patient to weight-bear. And trust me, for three weeks, patient was absolutely bedridden because his son is physiotherapist. Okay. And three weeks later, they call me and they said that there's a lot of pain and we NHS have to come for suture removal. They come in, we get an X-ray done. Embarrassing. Yeah. Did you Can I say something if I will not hurt anybody? Sometimes when you do complicated cases, it is better to allow your patients to mobilize on their own gently and slowly. Okay. Rather than have some other enthusiastic people push and pull. <laughs> Yeah, and then you know you are landed up with a problem, and then you are, and then it's one more surgery once more. You know, I'm but, sorry, I should not be saying more, but I've burnt my hands a lot of times. So now I've sort of learnt my lesson. When I do complicated cases, there is nobody except the patient and me. I don't mind if they take one or two months extra, but at that time is good enough, and we are fine. You save all your problems. So Doctor Vinay, what do you think is the cause of loosening in your case? Was it sub yes. subclinical infection or no, no no subclinical infection actually uh, you know what happens is this is what uh, I was taught and I read a lot about it and uh, I think um, Dr. Deepak Dawesar is also here he was present when I was presenting that case at Ish. Uh, so the thing is even when uh, we are even if, when the patient is at rest there are a lot of forces acting on the hip joint so if if at all your columns may seem to be very functional but if you don't have any uh, you know very great uh, column fit then there are high chances of uh, your cup collapsing inside. Uh, i think vinay what uh, uh, would you think that the different type of material a continuum or gription would be helpful and a multi hole that would be another very, two added things very very true sir think. very true very true very true and what was the age of the patient he was 65 We'll come back to Sanket's case. Yeah. Please. Okay. Sanket, you can take it forward, please. Yeah, this is the six-month uh, follow-up X-ray of uh, pelvis nice. growth, and it shows good healing of the uh, medial wall. And uh, like uh, Vinay, I would like to ask you just like in uh, if you get this case, would what different uh, you would have done? Like you have you would have got the CT scan, it would have shown that there is a some medial wall defect. And what what different you would have done? Like uh, did you use gription for this? So uh, I would have definitely used like uh, the way I just uh, pointed out. Would have definitely used a gription multi hole, uh, put in a lot of bone graft because. When you see discontinuity and if it's a if it's not an a, a, acute injury, there's always some membrane behind there. So it's gonna you know catch all your bone graft and then it builds up really nice. Okay. So yeah. Can I comment? Yes. I had presented my series and lot of bone graft, a smaller size cup, three screws. And let it heal. And I also had injection teriparatide. Okay. And 
because uh, the comment was from an american senior surgeon that if you put a bigger cup it takes lot of energy and doesn't keep you any option in future to change or revise and three screws are mandatory and the okay. cup as lateral as possible and the medial void is to be filled with copious graft i even some uh, use the whole graft from the head and even if necessary zimmer graft sir uh, uh, i would like to uh, just uh, share my experience like as you said you can you should bring the uh, cup as lateral as possible but uh, uh, the juniors should uh, keep in consideration that you should restore the hip center like if you lateralize the hip center too much like i myself uh, uh, had a, a problem like in one similar case i put lot of bone graft and did the reverse trimming and put the cup but cup was so considerably lateralized that uh, it eventually became loose even though it was fixed with two screws so uh, point here is to restore the hip center and uh, i would suggest that pre operative templating is mandatory here you should use template and uh, mark the hip center and uh, intraoperatively use the tear drop to locate your hip so that you don't medial you don't medialize but you should not lateralize the hip center too much also not too much of course yeah. not too much not too much yes mm -hmm. and uh, bone grafting whenever necessary cup placement on the rim like usually in case of pinnacle what uh, in osteoporotic uh, bone we prefer to under rim it by a millimeter or so so that we can get good press fit on the rim and of course as you said it is better to supplement it with uh, screws so that uh, we don't oh, get failure yes, yes yeah three screws true true i mean uh, hi this is dimple uh, can i say something yeah please sir so i mean couple of things if you put a lot of bone graft the uh, the screw fixation will not be as good as we want that is one thing so optimum bone graft is a important thing and second thing multi hole cup with if possible if required then there should be inferior screw also because when we put the cup There is a possibility that you tend to little bit uh, um, open the cup because you are little worried. You are not hammering too hard because you are worried about the medial wall which will uh, go inside, and that is why if inferior screw is there, it will be a little better to have a good better fixation. And we may rightly said uh, the patient when it, they are taking bed pan and all that there would be a lot of force superiorly. So if there is an in inferior screw in a well fixed will have some uh, better fixation yeah uh, can i make one comment i'm yes, dr bosley yeah uh, wonderful he has done a wonderful job everything is stable but few additional thing if you uh, see these uh, osteoporotic in rheumatoid is very common and there was little uh, fracture uh, which will be better seen on ct now these cases what it requires is a creation of bone uh, graft for future revision so head is always available so impaction bone grafting is must here the periphery the columns are good so what it requires is a building the medial bone uh, stock so bone graft is always there from the head so impaction bone grafting is must second thing is uh, try to rim only the periphery don't try to rim inside be careful remove try to preserve whatever subchondral bone is there medially and third thing is inclination of the cup preferably in such cases should be 40 degree so that more stress is on the superior part and the direction of cup is superior direction so 40 degree inclination is a good advice impaction bone grafting and a uh, multi hole screw is also one option and there is always risk of screws going medially so intraop x ray because many time we see the screws are protruding in the pelvis so that's a very common situation in this cases so intraop x ray you can withdraw the screw if it is penetrating too much in the pelvis thank you thank you sanket thank you so much sir can we go to vinay with the second case please Sure, sir. Good 
good one sanke thank you love to stop sharing your screen okay i will Good afternoon, everyone. Am I audible and visible? Yeah. Yes, very well. Uh, no, thank you, Meryl. <laughs> thank you, Meryl, for this opportunity. It's nice to you know keep on learning and you know uh, in this era, any which is there is hardly any work right now. <laughs> so uh, just a quick brief. Uh, sorry, twenty-eight year old young chap, very lean build. I complain of. pain in the left hip since only 4 years uh, he had back pain since almost 2 years he complained of gradual decrease in range of motion in his left hip and he had inability to walk properly inability to squat and sit cross legged when he came to us the on examination found out that he had a shortening of around 5 cm a large swelling on the trochanteric region uh, left hip was in flexion adduction and external rotation kind of a deformity almost 20 degrees of uh, fft with no further flexion no abduction possible these are the clinical pictures you see that trochanteric swelling there quite a bit of uh, shortening here if you see he is hardly able to you know for his foot plantar grade <clears throat> okay let me just try now if you see there is exaggerated lumbar lordosis okay. also this is a small walking video as to just see how he walks कपड़िया सर यू शुड टेक द लीड एंड गाइड अस रोटेशन No, it's, it's it's rather internal rotation. Okay. If you see, if you see okay. the uh, you know patient. Uh, yeah. yeah. Hmm. So, tell us your thoughts, Vinay. Well, my first thought was, oh shit. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, but uh, like you rightly said, uh, because there is no external rotation, and uh, I'm more well versed uh, to do the uh, posterior uh, you know approach. so it it makes me a little more confident to you know go in there and uh, you know kind of do whatever i wish to but yes at the same time uh, like the way such just mentioned in the previous this thing we had kept everything in the armamentorium ready uh, you know gripsion cups multi holes uh, dual mobility for that matter of fact as well and uh, so yeah we got his uh, spine x rays also done okay just to you know have a look whether the spine is actually mobile not mobile what is the spino pelvic uh, configuration in his case so the one on the left uh, this is the standing one where you can see exaggerated lumbar lordosis the one on the right is uh, in sitting posture true so so now we know that there is no uh, you know uh, spino pelvic uh, fixation is not there so that way we are more comfortable because it's more mobile kind of a deformity that we dealing up blood work up was pretty normal uh, we also did not uh, do any ct scan because i mean in this case ct was not very uh, uh, required so vinay i, you know, I would like any Sorry. thoughts about the uh, the diagnosis why this has happened what is the reason for the ankylosis 
he he does not give any positive history he does not remember his his uh, history starts only 4 years back that he developed pain he he has no x rays done in the past and uh, he was only taking medications he came to us because he could not squat or sit cross legged which till till 2 years 3 years back he used to do it but with pain and he developed this swelling in the trochanteric region like hard swelling in the trochanteric region that is why he was worried and that is why he came to us okay so when i uh, was he expecting to sit cross leg after surgery or what was your counseling to him what uh, realistic expectation you explained him <laughs> no no honestly speaking uh, i tell every patient undergoing hip replacement that you know you are never going to sit cross legged you should avoid sitting cross legged because i'm not a very big fan and uh, since since last 3 years my only uh, convincing line here is that since last 3 years you've not uh, sat cross legged or you've not squatted has that made any changes in your life if it does not then you don't have to do it uh, for the rest of your life so uh, it's okay if you don't uh, squat but you'll be able to walk normally so if walking is uh, the concern if pain free uh, is the concern then uh, we should go in for the surgery and i think uh, most of the patients nowadays agree uh, not squatting and not uh, sitting cross legged yes and the amount of pelvic obliquity that we are seeing here yeah. like did you take that into your uh, planning consideration and how did you uh, address that yes uh, so when you see this that was the reason i was a little worried and that is the reason why you got the spine x rays also done okay so only wanting to see if if this lordosis was not corrected exaggerated lordosis was not corrected my entire plan would change on as to how i would want to put my acetabular cup in this case okay but since this spine is pretty uh, mobile that makes it more easier to go in and uh, put my cup in a normal position where i would want it to you know what about the inclination sorry what about the inclination of cup because lateral spine view does not give idea about the inclination of cup very, very true very true lateral mm-hmm. does not give the inclination but at the same time in such cases you don't want to keep your cup very open very close uh i would prefer to keep 10% out so that it's moderately uh, you know closed and as well as not open at the same time because when this adduction deformity corrects okay. if you're if you've kept a very close cup and when this corrects out it's going to be really close and it's going to start impinging so you don't want to keep it very close again at the same time you don't want to keep it very open as well okay. and actually here yeah, the spine and the opposite hip are quite normal so i don't think there should be much of a problem yeah. Yeah, yeah. It'll take a lot of compensation for the other side. So I don't. That should not be really much of a trouble. I think. I don't know. Tell us, what did you do then? Finally. So uh, again, just putting forth. Somebody is asking yeah, something. Yeah. Just putting forth a few points. Uh, we did uh, the adductor tenotomy uh, before putting him into a lateral position. Uh, position is very very important in these cases. You have to fix the patient really nice. so that you know there is no movement here and there strap him really well but try to get uh, the shoulder and the hip all in line and uh, we went to the conventional postural approach uh, there is no minimal invasive in this so please try and avoid doing minimal invasive in such uh, cases uh, you can see uh, it is nicely visible here and like i said very comfortable with the posterior approach so uh, i would try worst case scenario if somebody just asked me if there is an external deformity if there was an external deformity we would have to do it like dual approach i would have done a dual approach there are people who do direct anterior as well but i would have done a dual approach went in did my neck cut from the anterior approach come back and do the rest of the hip uh, from the posterior approach that would make things more easier because i am more comfortable doing it more from posteriorly and not anteriorly but in this case because it was a uh, in, internal rotation the neck was right here so idea was to take cut as proximal as possible you can cut the neck once twice more but so as flush towards the head as possible so the hip was totally fused sorry sir yeah hip was totally fused there no yes, movement yes. at all no movement at all no movement okay. at all okay. so i had to take an in c to cut in c to cut Fine. put in lot of spikes retractors save everything try not to go all the way to the uh, you know to wall of the pelvic wall and yeah this is what we achieved okay 
and if you see quite a lot of uh, adduction already corrected right away right and when your surgery was over did you think that you have to add, uh, see look at the adductor side again or it was quite free it was quite free because yeah because uh, it is quite free uh, post operatively also because like you rightly said in these cases would have to definitely go back and assess once again to see if you know the so what i do is in the these cases don't really staple the uh, you know incision at the adductor side just right. put a dressing if required go back in again do a little bit of more release from the seam and then staple it off yeah when did you stop reaming the acetabulum when did i stop reaming in this case uh, honestly just uh, when we felt really good uh, anterior posterior that's it if you see my cup is more uh, you know facing superior trying to get a little higher hip center in this uh, at the same time uh, when you see this there the tall is always present here i had to keep the cup in so that i am a little more close like i said 10% 15% close cup and try and uh, you know ream uh, the superior part more because medially there is hardly anything so i don't want to go any more medial in this case no just i wanted to mention the fat pad sign yeah sorry dr patsore right. emphasizes yes 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 so uh, for it is every time you go in any kind of hip fat pad signs always going to be there tall is always going so these two are the markers which are always always present so when you start reaming and uh, it becomes a thin wafery kind of a thing you will always feel that fat underneath it and that's when you know that you've actually the you know the transition from head to uh, acetabulum usually it is quite easy to make out that now the head is over and now you are in yeah. the acetabulum the quality of your reaming immediately changes, changes. suddenly yeah. you come across a little bit of sclerotic bone which was not there before exactly and you can see a faint cortical area you know in the middle suddenly yeah. and you know okay now that is where i have reached the acetabulum and then you get your bearing very easily from there i think when i comment on you, the, have, you feel the size would have been little smaller possible mm. size yes you was your call sorry yes yes uh, so uh, i was honestly speaking i was a little skeptical as to you know because it was an uh, adduction deformity so i wanted to keep it a little close and that was the reason why i chose a, a size bigger cup to you know kind of get that uh, thing i did not want to because he's 28 my choice of i i wouldn't have wanted to do a dual mobility in this case i would have if i would have gone for a cup smaller i would have definitely used a dual mobility in that case would have made really uh, easier for him but yes a size bigger uh, here is definitely there this is just an observation vinay you have done a very good job but if you see the opposite hip the uh, offset is quite more like the horizontal offset <laughs> and uh, i have faced this problem in uh, stiff hips or chronically arthritic hips that uh, the uh, we find it to be stable with lesser offset also and we end up putting it in a lesser offset so <clears throat> post operatively 6 months 1 year down the line they do have some adductor lurch kind of thing so any uh, guidance from the seniors uh, to how to restore the horizontal offset in such stiff cases i was about to comment this is a good because here on the opposite if it is definitely a varus hip mm. and yeah. i think you require the varus stem processes RSTEM. on this side to have helped you to make the hip what sanket is saying your his walking pattern should be come well but again here he had a severe adduction deformity so the abductors yes. were stretched out quite badly quite bad so maybe you have to really now here is where you will require physio to build up his abductors and his extensors so dire dire maybe over 6 months to a year he should come back to a reasonably good gait pattern and avoid that funny abductor lurch while walking but no, i think sanket i would agree I... with sanket that the varus processes would have been a good choice for this side because the opposite side is definitely varus there's no question yeah. even though the pelvis is tilted that's it on the x-ray but still if you look at the hip it definitely shows some form of varus plus there was quite a bit of uh, shortening so you know try to you know stretch that out as well so your soft tissue balancing that way uh, is more easier in these stems rather than putting a uh, varus stem and just uh, i have uh, never done uh, adductor tenotomy in such type of cases and uh, just uh, Uh, let the adductors stretch out gradually 
but uh, that that is a personal choice just to mention that uh, they quite reasonably they come out and gradually the adductor adductor deformity is correct uh, corrected you sleep well with you know tommy can i can i share <laughs> oh, yeah can i can i make a comment yes sir yeah pradeep yeah, yeah it's a uh, nicely done but few things can be added one is a uh, soft tissue release which also includes a uh, release of iliopsoas in such, such cases you can you can see there's a rotated pelvis mm. that is one thing and uh, offset uh, basically soft tissue whatever offset it permits that's very important and soft tissue gets stretch over a period of time but tenotomy of adductor is must and even iliopsoas in such cases is very important even so even gmax release even gmax release in such high riding cases uh, gmax release but uh, it's not a good idea because gmax you have to release and suture it back suture it back yeah so that is important should not release gmax unless it is too tight and here it is adduction so there is no question of tightness of gmax now this case is not classical ankylosing spondylitis this could be old tb or rheumatoid yeah. something and whenever there is a adduction internal rotation posterior approach is excellent whenever there is a external rotation abduction you must have a an anterior approach which is very easy dual approach which i have practiced for almost 29 years and you cut the neck then you get mobility and then easily you can go posteriorly do wonderful soft tissue release and very simple but whenever there is a internal rotation deformity everybody should be aware that anterior surgeons they should learn to take some help from <laughs> posterior uh, approach surgeons because it's very difficult otherwise overall it is good and overall over a period of time the soft tissue gets yeah. stretched out and this is a rotated view so you can't comment too much on the offset mm. just uh, there is some inherent pelvic uh, deformity on the left side now we don't know in the earlier part what is pelvis was but there's something definitely not right with the pelvis over there yeah. and in only 3 years if the hip has gone into an ankylosis it yeah. cannot cause a pelvic deformity like this true it is there from before some pathology is going on and maybe he was not much bothered about it and he just was continuing and on finally because he was not able to walk and with that as you said the trochanteric protrusion he came to yeah yeah now But one it, important it, thing yeah one important thing is here the spine is mobile mm. and there is no fixed pelvic obliquity so whatever uh, the uh, apparent uh, shortening everything will get corrected, corrected. soft tissue will get stretched and mm. i think hip is quite stable which yes confirm on the table uh, it is little more close but it is okay acceptable and he will do well over a period of time vinay somebody from audience is asking about the bearing that you have used sorry somebody what from bearing is what bearing you have used yeah it's 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 a ceramic it's a ceramic head okay. ceramic on high cross leg okay. okay can you show us the gate your yeah. video this is uh, the post op immediately oh some problem i think come on any follow up extra there some problem i think i ah uh, there it is coming you see it, it should it is about to end here and it's still <laughs> not starting oh, i think uh, they just do you do you have the video right can you can can you like i just show this and then we'll uh, can you play the video later they just yeah. sure. it looks much better yeah so just yeah, wanted to show this uh, yeah. this is at 6 weeks Yes, yes. It's pretty and comfortable. Yes, and yes. I, I, I just chose not to give him a shoe raise here, just to see what his actual, you know, gait is mm-hmm. in this. I think in this one, it's corrected quite well. Yeah, yeah. quite. It was an apparent uh, shortening, and I think pelvis is. Uh, uh, looks I, quite I, I think we'll see the videos. Mm-hmm. Uh, It's done quite nicely. Yeah. He's clearing his leg very well. Little bit of internal rotation, but that will come away in time. 
I think when I hear you, you'll have to send him to physio whether you want it or not. <laughs> <laughs> so the closest physio to his village is like fifty-five <laughs> kilometers. That's <laughs> that. Okay. So yeah, this is uh, the six-week uh, X-ray. Okay. Yeah, good job. Nice, nice. There is a question from audience: like, how much lateralized the cup should be placed from teardrop in case of protrusion or uh, normal uh, primary THR? Uh, tear, tear, tal is a very good indicator for uh, anatomical landmark of the cup. Even any position of the lateral supine position. uh tal is a best landmark for uh, putting cup anatomically now there are two things one is a version cup version and second is the inclination so cup version the plane of the socket should be in the plane of the uh it should be parallel to the tal and for inclination 45 degree inclination if the socket is just inside medial to the tal so if it is more medial it may be more than less than 45 degree but for 45 degree it has to be just inside the tal medial to tal if it is outside the tal you can say for sure the inclination is more than 45 degree. more than 45 okay yeah 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 this is quite good compared to his earlier gait is walking nicely He'll improve in time for sure. Yeah, yeah he he's got a lot of uh, muscle tissue. Yeah, you can see, very and everything will improve over a period of time. Okay. Definitely. Okay. Thank you, Vinay. Can I call yeah. upon Milind now to yeah, start with his case? Doctor Milind. Yeah, ready, ready, coming. <laughs> rejoin i will have to rejoin like by the time uh, milin sir rejoins can we just uh, uh, can i ask that in this type of stiff hips would dual mobility had make any difference or anybody would have gone for it in primary stiff hips i don't think the choice of implant um, will, de- will decide your final range of movement it is your soft tissue release and is your surgery and your missing that is going to decide i don't know what pradeep has to say okay uh, now dual mobility uh has got biggest advantage of stability but one small issue is always uh, uh, remaining that longevity now all these patients are young patient and uh, uh their mobility because of the stiffness is very that- less so dislocation in ankylosing hip fuse is not a major issue if uh, components are put correctly because the soft tissues are stiff and mobility is also very poor unlike other normal people so dislocation is not a major issue in most of the ankylosing i've done about 260 uh, fused hip and uh, uh, i'm not worried about uh, dislocation main thing is the longevity so dual mobility is excellent if you are not confident about the stability use dual mobility but we don't know about longevity more than 15 20 years so that is a one small issue in using in young people but whenever the socket is too small less than uh, i would say 40 44 then dual mobility does have a role because you can give a better stable rather than using 22 mm head so avoid 22 mm head in fuse shape use dual mobility but if you can use a 32 or 36 then that is better because longevity is a problem for dual mobility so dual mobility in young patients is any which is a burning issue and i per se i'm not a very big fan of using it uh, in younger patients but uh, bosley sir what is your take on 
dual mobility in younger patients when would you want to use them in a younger patient yeah only when the acetabular size when uh, we need to use 22 mm head you know 40 44 mm uh, reamer size you have to go forcefully for 22 mm head in right. those cases selectively you must use dual mobility even young people hmm. because 22 there is a very high risk of dislocation so avoid 22 mm head Yeah, so and that Dr. is. Bosa, we used to do twenty-two yeah. head uh, in our beginning of practice, and it was not that bad if you do a proper job. But uh, clinically, when you are doing and we are not confident, so it is always better to keep it. In a younger patient, the chances of dislocation is less compared to the elderly patient. If you make them understand what is the importance of everything, then they understand the uh, restriction of the movement initially, and then they do don't do it. so i mean all practical point of view dual mobility should be used in a very elderly patients uh, where we want to avoid dislocation this is for avoid dislocation that's all i mean nothing no other advantage uh, of dual mobility apart from any other thing yeah i am ready dr milan yes, yeah i am ready sorry excuse me sorry you are on yeah i am on am i audible yes loud and clear yeah <laughs> Uh, i'm extremely sorry that they just got disconnected uh, i thank meril and everybody of you hi pradeep hi hi we we'll seeing you after long time yes Shakin nice bhai. to see you bolo okay i bring you greeting from miraj ami and uh, shekhar joins me and hello everybody from spain <laughs> hi hello hello Yeah, this is a 35-year-old uh, male operated six months back. Came to me like this. Uh, both column fracture. Bo probably the surgeon had done a trochanteric osteotomy. Why I don't know. Mm. But the worrying part is where is the head. So first thing I thought was of infection. Mm -hmm. Major surgery, uh, uh, dual plating. Uh, the infection so aspirated lab everything normal uh, of course in india such guys come walking in your consulting room with a limp they don't complain much of pain but of course he had pain and shortening and unstable gait and uh, this is the x ray as a routine all uh, patients posted for uh, total hip uh, spine x ray is mandatory so all labs normal Uh, total arthrogram shows shortening. Then the three D CT imaging again worrying is there. Is, there are um, uh, laboratory X ray. If you have carefully seen, there is no sign of infection. L uh, clinically laboratory, and so of course we do all the CT mandatory. Three D implants, and uh, this shows. that the on day 1 the acetabulum were the implants were perforating mm -hmm. so the acetabulum was going it was getting bad so now uh, this also of course the however good software you have the metal will going to give you and the main thing is the posterior wall is deficit so case is open Pradeep, can we see the previous CT? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So you have wonderfully ruled out the infection. So it's a clean case. Everything uh, aspirated. Yeah, it's good. Uh, kept him again for three mm -hmm. weeks without antibiotic, of course. Yeah. So now there is a you can uh, explore good exposure after good exposure. I will go for posterior exposure and. Uh, uh see that you have to reconstruct the posterior wall don't uh, uh try to chase the uh implant try to remove the implant whatever comes in your way screws you may have to remove it and there's already plate so you can reconstruct some bone graft some part of the head can be used and uh, whatever uh, you uh, get a good bone support yeah use it 
so uh, stem is not a problem so only reconstruction so what are options you have whether you want to use a bone graft only or if you need any additional em cone support but don't try to remove the plate and to worry the discussion yeah milin go ahead it is the sound can i ask uh, pradeep sir yeah yeah uh, good afternoon sir dr kartik here uh, without the removing plate how can we uh, build the poster wall because the plates are on the dead on the poster wall yeah so the building of the uh, poster wall to put the bone graft and uh, uh, so we have to remove the, at least one plate uh you can remove the screws because if you try to there's a lot of fibrosis and this mm. is a bed for the, i mean it will be around the sciatic nerve so there is mm. a very high risk of uh, because there's a fibrosis very difficult to dissect right up to lower part and uh, so that's the only worry if you can remove easily it is fine otherwise you can just remove the screws and uh, whatever support is there use a bone graft there's no infection so that is a safer approach uh, because if you try to remove plate itself very massive surgery and there is a risk of injury to sciatic nerve that is a very important this fibrotic area it's very difficult to identify and, and even a plate can act as a buttress also so like support yes, to that you can use a bone graft and make use of that support now yeah, milan and amrible um, Yeah, you are back, Milan. Is a multi-volume. Hello. Uh, Doctor Nin, you can switch off. It looks like there is an internet connection problem at your end. Can you switch off your video uh, so that uh, there will be good transmission from your end? So Milan is not audible either. Maybe you can run the slides ahead so that. Is it advisable to take intra-op uh, frozen section to uh, confirm absence of infection in such cases? Like always, you have to do it. That's a standard mm. procedure. So that is a part of the that is a part of the surgery itself. You will always do it. All revisions and all complicated. It should be done very high incidence. Yeah. Am I audible now? Sorry. Yeah, yeah Milan. Yeah, this is what I did now. I'll cut out the. I had to graft it because mm -hmm. I was not very happy the about the bed, so I cut yeah. it from the top center, and uh, the cup was very nice and rigid. Mm -hmm. uh, look at this view; it is very nicely fixed. Mm -hmm. So I have, of course, I used a multi-hole cup and added graft and made him walk. Of course, we support for six weeks. Can be debated uh, because even uh, non-weight bearing is as good as putting the pressure on the implants. I agree with him, and he was very happy with it. And this is one year follow-up. Oh, excellent! Very good, very good, very nice, very nice. Good, good. Get ceramic, ceramic, on ceramic. All my heads are ceramic. Yeah. Excellent case. Excellent. Thanks. So you removed one plate. Eight million. Yeah, that that only thing which uh, uh, comes in the way. Yeah. Okay. okay. Fine. Even I had uh, kept the uh, implant cutter in the in ready. If it uh -huh. coming away and I cannot remove, it, so I can just cut that portion of the plate. Correct. If you have a Midas Rex, it is very comfortable in the theater. Little bit of protrudes in your end, you can just trim it off with the Midas, and it is very comfortable. You don't have to do very major surgery. I think Pradeep would agree to that. Uh, yeah, it's. I uh, can't afford an S class. 
<laughs> Dr. Milan, I will not say anything on this platform. <laughs> Sir, I want to ask, like, did you give any uh, prophylaxis for uh, HO in this case? I had thought of, I had thought of, even uh, I, there is a linear accelerator uh, in the neighboring cancer hospital, but I just gave endometacin. Okay. Because one protrusive, I burnt my fingers. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so getting heterotic ossification and went higher. Just a moment. Even that, that nightmare is not yet over. If you carefully see this portion, there is slight HO. Hmm. So you are seeing this? Yes. Yes. So that is a very important point. Uh, yeah. Not to dissect too many implants. That causes too much of dissection and increased risk of HO. So hmm. minimum dissection and whatever you can reconstruct is a best option. Especially in hip surgery. If you go into the gluteus minimus, I, I realized that if you lift the minimus from the pelvis, a lot of times you get a lot of newborn formation, especially when you lift the minimus. With the maximus doesn't cause so much of a problem. Mm -hmm. You must be giving endometacin and things like that. Yeah. <laughs> nice one, Milan. Thank you. Uh, sir, there is you one question. Care? Uh, there is one question in the chat box. Would you like to take that yeah. from Dr. Ankur? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So there is in case of posterior column plate, you have to cut screws and then put up uh, the cup. Mm -hmm. That is the question of Dr. Uh, Shingal. I think they just what I think. So the question here is uh, by Dr. Ankur Singhal, and he's asking in case of posterior column plate. You have to cut the screws and then put a cup? No, those which come in way, those only I will remove. That's what the answer is. Hmm. And I will cut that much portion and rest it will remain there because it is stable. It has two, three screws above, two, three screws below. So I need not dissect everything, remove the whole implant and then go for my cup placement or reaming, etc. And usually these place, so whatever the, the acetabular surgery is good, here it's just a little bit proximal. So majority time they don't. If you see that, the plate is seen, but it does not coming in my way. Yeah, that's the correct philosophy of doing these surgeries. What is not troubling you, don't look at it and don't try to no, do it. No, no. Leave it alone. And, yes. And then you feel like you remove one or two screws, you say, Aray, ek rahe gaya, usko bhi nikal hai, yaar. <laughs> and then it go, takes one hour. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you, Dr. Millen. Can I call Thank on you. Dr. Ambar to start your case, please? Dr. Ambar yes. Mittal. Yes, please. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. So, greetings from Indore. So, is it visible, everything? Yeah. Okay. Good, Ambar. Yeah. Okay, sir. So, the history of the patient is, it's a 36-year-old male who has sustained a road traffic accident in December of 2017. And he also sustained multiple injuries along with that. So, he sustained fracture of shaft femur on the right side, along with uh, brain injuries, intracranial hemorrhages, optic nerve uh, injuries. And he was taken to some other hospitals where he was operated for femur uh, interlock nailing at that time. Patient came to me on Feb 2018, around two months afterwards or three months afterwards with pain in the opposite hips. So just to cut short, so this was the x-ray at that time. So there was an interlock nail on the right side and you can see on the left side, there is a fracture acetabulum. So it was a case of a neglected fracture acetabulum might be because the uh, patient had uh, multiple uh, intracranial hemorrhages, patients were irritable, patient was bedridden for two, two and a half months. And patient came only uh, after two and a half to three months, the attenders realized that the, uh, the position of that limb is, in, is not good. And uh, the patient started feeling pain. And then they uh, came to me. So this was the x-ray. Uh, lateral view is, I'm sorry for this, the quality is not very good. So I will jump right to the CT. 
So as you can see from the CT, uh, there is an anti-column fracture with some combination, might be some degree of healing. This is the post, the view from the, there is a complete posterior column fracture with some combination, maybe some evidence of some healing. So now the questions from the audience is now what to, how to proceed. Both column fractures with combination, a 37 year old male, two and a half to three month old injury. Yeah, this is a pelvic discontinuity. Mm -hmm. Now we have to uh, make sure that uh, whether there is any mobility patient, uh, how is the stress x-ray, is there any pain or what is the hip mobility at the moment? So it, it's painful because the the patient was uh, ridden for so much period of time. It was a stiff hip anyhow. And patient was unconscious for around, I think, a month. And then when he regained his consciousness and afterwards. So uh, at present, there is a restricted range of motion and it's a painful range of movement. As you can expect in these cases of pelvic discontinuity. Yes, so... Uh... Classically, I mean, you need a, some trivicular metal cup cage is the best construct, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, stem is not a problem. It's a reconstruction yeah. of the stable uh, socket. Cup. Yeah. yeah. And ideal uh, is a multi-hole, mm -hmm. but uh, cup cage is a very good con solid construct. Mm -hmm. TM augments may be very useful. Any so role of posterior requires, plating? Uh, plating, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not in favor of. Okay. Best is a multi-hole cup through which you can uh, take a very good support of the whatever residual mm -hmm. bone, mm -hmm. intact bone. Mm -hmm. And there's one concept of uh, distraction, mm -hmm. but I have not done that. And uh, I'm more fond of uh, uh, complete uh, multi-hole trabecular metal cup, okay. which gives excellent stability. Mm. Anybody else? Not, I don't know, because it's difficult to do a total hip replacement when the acetabular pillars are not healed. I would. Uh, is, in my mind, it would be more sensible to wait for, he's already waited for two and a half months, wait for some more time, allow the whole thing to heal and then revise it into a THR. It should be comparatively So, easy. how much time do you want to wait? Wait another two months more, what is the problem? I would have kept... Okay. Uh, no. Because if he has gone for my columns... That is difficult. Then you have to fix the column, get your acid, get your columnar integrity yeah. first, and then you think about the hip. Anybody? It not healed. Obviously, yeah. it is still healing. Oh. It is only two and a half yeah. months old. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think, I think we should just put an hip society screw, distract it, pull it out, no. let things fall back, and uh, have a word with your pelvic acetabular friend. Uh, ask him to have a look. Uh, and I, honestly, uh, because having burnt uh, fingers at one of these. Would definitely want to you know fix this up and then go in for a total hip. So two can stage. I? Can I? Yeah, please. Yeah. So yeah. It, it, this is a transverse acetabulum fracture, and uh, uh, before jumping to hip replacement, uh, both column must be fixed, and uh, uh, no hip society screw if you are planning the hip replacement because literature supports putting the hip society screw increases the chances of the infection later on. So. Uh, we can go anteriorly and posteriorly uh, and posterior column is the main thing. You have to fix the posterior column. Uh, putting the cup in this much displaced posterior column, uh, survival shape of the cup will be uh, questionable. So I would definitely like to reconstruct the posterior column at least with uh, GT osteotomy or whatever extensional approach and uh, two plates and then single setting the hip replacement or can wait for the hip replacement. The post reconstruction of posterior column is must. Okay. Okay. Anybody now, uh, I would add one more thing. In fresh fracture, yes, you must go and uh, stabilize it. But in a two and a half month, three month, already some bone, there's no way you can do anatomical reduction. So you have to create stability. And uh, uh, if it is uh, still mobile, then you can use a larger size head is a best technique which is the distraction and that adds the stability to the socket with multiple screw hole and it gives a very good uh, stability if you use a larger size socket with automatically with impaction some uh, distraction so that is a standard option because don't try to fix it and then go second stage you have to do everything 
at the same stage and which is well described everywhere so acute is totally different than this don't go for two stage you have to do reconstruction on the same stage and it heals up very well i agree with pradeep here it, you cannot heal this acetabulum i would you know, without an integ without an integrated pelvis it is difficult to do a proper thr that's my personal thing anyway what uh, ambal tell us what did you yeah. do so i i am student of pradeep sir so i did what he say what he is saying so just took out all this used the head for my bone grafting so this is what we were talking about this was the inside picture you can see a wonderful tal here so as far as the inclination uh, comes what sir was uh, saying was we should keep the cup parallel to this and our the inferior edge of the cup should be slightly inside to this so as to give a good uh, uh, inclination to the cup so this was this after putting the bone graft so i do not use any shan spins over here or stenman pin over here uh, all these are retractors this is the anterior part this is inferior this is posterior this is superior so all the things are by retractor we do not want to damage sciatic nerve in this sort of distorted anatomy use whatever bone graft i have from the head for this i kept the patient non weight bearing for 6 weeks after 6 weeks uh, protected weight bearing was allowed and full weight bearing was allowed after 3 months so this was the x ray this was the post op x ray this was the 45 day post op x ray i couldn't find i think uh, early post op x rays so this was i used multi hole cups so put some screws above as well as here also i did not try to correct uh, this type of because it was very rigid so there was no chance of reduction at 3 months and also because of the healing by body itself over a period of 2 and 1/2 to 3 months so there was sufficient coverage for me during the surgery i could feel i could get press fit during the surgery so i need not require a special cup or cage construct also i kept everything ready but even i could get away with a simple multi hole cup so uh, because it was a 3 month old i could get a rigid fixation and i used multi hole cups and i kept patient non weight bearing so this was the 6 months so all you can see the trabeculies and all these even in 45 days you can see uh, the bone graft are arranged in the line of stresses accordingly the lamellies and you can see and this is at the one year follow up so the patient also had some issues over uh, the femur was not united so i had to do bone grafting and all those things so i do not encourage my patients to sit cross legged but if at all they want to sit i allow ask them uh, if they want they can sit only on couch but i strongly advise against the this uh, type of sitting so still some okay i'll show the videos i don't know whether so yeah that's a beautiful result ambar excellent result yeah i do not encourage patient was very <laughs> enthusiastic he wanted to show me what he can do but i do not encourage all these type should of should give your picture in his house nice one number what is the size thing. of the cup that you used i don't remember exactly i think it should be around 50 50 yeah. 52 yeah. uh ambar wonderful job uh, yes. congratulations fantastic you, job you have done a uh, uh, few more things you can still gone ahead with one or larger size cup and okay. uh, trabecular metal cup really makes wonderful uh, thing uh, because so only fear that you get is that you do not want to explode you do not want that cup because you want to contain because i got a good feeling of that press fit fit during that cup if i would have gone a higher reaming size i was worried that i might open up the pelvis so i do not want that no, it was my uh, feeling it was my it, it it never opens up in fact uh, okay. we advise distraction, distraction. so mm-hmm. distraction really gives a, a good compression you know of the okay. okay okay so initial distraction which requires a forceful distraction mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. uh, they use a mechanical distraction and once you put a cup it really gives a excellent stability so, so how it much never opens up so whatever one much? size uh, two okay. millimeter okay. extra okay. higher size okay. is always uh, better but you have done a wonderful job with fantastic result and 36 head is a very good option yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so i think larger head larger right. movement excellent yeah. very nice yeah it heals up very well if there's initial stability yes sir yes, sir. so and today think, uh, like uh, literature Sarah's is there, very mm-hmm. sorry No, no, you go ahead. Amber, sir has put up a very nice point, and I think we discussed on this when we met in Indore last time. Yeah. A trabecular yeah, yeah. metal cup uh, was probably the choice of implant here, and yeah. he's been stressing on this uh, mm-hmm. quite a lot. So I think yeah. uh, 
Should Astro have... integration is yeah. super with that. Yeah. Because that is from my personal you, experience. You put the inferior screw as well, Amber, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yes, multi-hole coupe. Like, yeah. I would like to ask like, how to locate the uh, position for the inferior screw in uh, these cases. Like many times, uh, we don't find it uh, properly at... Sir, I and think uh, it's, uh, there are two, three ways, but I feel the most is trial and... We edge to drill through the cup as per our uh, direction. Uh, so, if you find that uh, ischial screw is... Mostly ischial screw, uh, we can pass through the periphery of the cup. Uh, regular screw holes cannot allow us to put the ischial screws and pubic screws. So, if we are putting the Timas cup or any highly porous coated cup, you can drill through the cup. And you can put the ischial screw under CM or by your clinical guidance. And you can also put the pubic MI, superior pubic MI screw. So that is a privilege using that cup. Yeah. True. Excellent, Amber. Amber. Very good. Nice one. And you showed a complete result with yes. good <laughs> consolidation. That's a yeah. very yeah. compliment. So this is my fifth case of such. It has come healed very well. Everything has healed beautifully nicely. Yeah, Excellent. Yeah, that is what happens in a... If you give a good stable uh, construct. Yeah, very nice. Very so, nice. so can I conclude just a bit, if it's okay? Sure. Uh, just short. So what are the advantages of early THR in these cases? Is, as we show, we, it avoids the risk of morbidity or mortality associated with prolonged incumbency of two-stage surgeries. We have a smaller approach because we can ex expose the acetabulum from the same approach. We have to remove just like a THR. Non-anatomical reduction being more acceptable as we are uh, doing a total hip. And there's no risk of post-traumatic osteoarthritis. Uh, literature does not have a large evidence base on early total hip for uh, acetabular fractures. Around 300 cases have been reported in literature and the follow-up is relatively short with higher complication rates. So what is what it concludes is when we should do acute total hip replacement, when the fracture configuration, bone stock or bone quality would not allow for a stable fixation. In elderly patients, in whom fixation is possible, but their health ex life expectancy or ability to rehabilitate would increase their risk and the, it would negate the benefit of fixation because fixation has its own uh, downsides. And if there is a damage to the articular surface is severe, so there is a very high chance of post-traumatic osteoarthritis in these type of cases. And in some cases of with associated neck uh, fracture or there is a pre-existing arthritis. So in these cases, only uh, acute total hip should be attempted. Once a decision to perform an acute THA has been done, gaining bone stability is vital, what we are discussing. So we have to get stability, whether we use plate or without plates, whether we use cage or without cages, gaining bony uh, bone stability is vital. It's a technically demanding procedure, so needs proper surgical ex expertise. And the trend is moving from either fix or replace. So we do not talk either we have to do fix or replace. It's towards fix and replace. So we do both the things simultaneously nowadays in many cases together. So. I thank you from Indore and I, I thank uh, everybody, Dr. Kapadia, Dr. Bosley, everybody and Meryl guys uh, for this presentation. Thank you, Ambar. Thank can you, I sir. call upon Dr. Martin? Dr. Martin Zimmerman? Yes. Can you hear me? I will start now. Uh, yes, we are all ready. Okay. I will start to share my presentation. Okay. Do you have it? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, very good. Uh, first of all, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And I would like to thank uh, Meryl for inviting me at this uh, master course. After all this very interesting uh, case presentation, I will have no, uh, let's say, a simple presentation about some impact of the implant materials on clinical outcome. First, I have a disclaimer. As you may know, I am a consultant for Ceramtech, which is the manufacturer of the Biolog ceramic components that I will speak about right now. We know that uh, by having, uh, by having uh, total hip replacement, we have improving function, reducing pain, but we're still facing some challenges. If you look now, there's a reason of revisions for knee, knee atroplasty or hip atroplasty, we still have PGI as a main cause of revision, dislocation, periprosthetic fractures, adverse local tissue reactions, some pain, and still metal sensitivity and toxicity. If you look now from the point of view of the patient, what impacts the clinical outcome? 
we can see that some uh, factors are what you call modifiable, like obesity, smoking, alcohol, or activity level. But some of the factors are not modifiable. Of course, the gender, age, ethnicity, and of the case, some comorbidities. If you look now from the treatment algorithm, what impacts the clinical outcome? The place of surgery, the type of procedures, the surgical approach, the type of fixation, but also the choice of the material, metal, polyethylene of ceramics may impact the outcome of the surgery. If you look now specifically on the material of the choice of the material from the point of view of the selection of the bearing couple, here are the criteria which is important to respect. First of all, of course, the biocompatibility, but also chemical stability, infection resistance, corrosion resistance, scratch resistance, and wear resistance are very important to improve the results of the surgery. I will speak in this presentation about two aspects. If you look about the human response on the cellular level, I will speak first of all from the aspect of the bulk material, the surface of the implant directly, and the effect on the patient, but also the effect on the particles level, what it has on the patient. As you can see here, what you want to have is a perfect tissue integration, encapsulation of particle removal, that you have appropriate inflammation. Let me start with the particles. As shown here, the particles create different kinds of activation of various cell types. And these cell types can create at the end for the patient what we call the appropriate inflammation, as shown here on the top level, but also what we call the inappropriate inflammation by having osteolysis, metallosis, necrosis, and of course, we have to avoid that. So we have to understand a bit better about the role of the particulates. If you look now at this presentation of uh, in vitro studies based on modern material used for total hypotroplasty, you can see on the left-hand side how the use of with the standard ISO uh, in vitro testing up to 5 million cycles. There's actually no difference if you look on the ceramic or nitrous polyethylene with vitamin E compared to cobalt chrome. But this changed drastically if you're adding some what you call the third body wear in order to create what a suboptimal situation. And you can see now by having this third body wear, you increase not only the wear of the polyethylene, the acros polyethylene, but also the wear of the cobalt chrome. That means they are creating now particulates, metallic particulates of cobalt chrome within the, the, patient, the bodies of the patient. Actually, it's very easy to make a difference about the me mechanical integrity of the surface of the material. You can use a diamond indentation and you make a testing just to see the scratch resistance. And if you have the scratch resistance, you can see now the Bilox Delta on top. It is a diamond which moves on the surface of the material. And you can see that only appearance of the scratch about mid 50 Newton or 1.5 millimeter displacement. By having cobalt chrome already by alpha millimeter, you already have the appearance of the scratch. So I think that's something which is well known from your side. We have with Bilox Delta 10 times higher scratch resistance than cobalt chrome. The question is now, okay, we have some particle which is emitted by the cobalt chrome ball heads, but also with ceramic. What about these particulates? And now we have a very interesting study, in vitro study, which has been done a few years ago, showing the influence of the particulates on the human response of the body at the cellular level. You can see here with the ceramic on the left-hand side with Bilox Delta, but it has been also done with Bilox 40, which was the previous generation of the ceramic and with cobalt chrome, that even with a high concentration, which are relevant for clinically, there is no reaction and no creating a cytotoxic effect of the ceramic particles. In contrary to the cobalt chrome particles, as you can see here, if you achieve a high level a threshold of the particle levels, you have now the release of the human mediators, cytokine, such as TNF-alpha, which creates now a cellular reaction in the patient. So the point is now that, okay, you may have some particulates coming from the way of ceramic, even though very low, but never in the situation that it creates any reactions in the body. Let me look to another stuff about the metal ions. Metal ions can come either from the bulk material as well as from the particles. And depending on where they come from, they create different kinds of reactions. We can have what you call metal hypersensitivity or metal toxicity, like we have this metallosis, very typical observed with metal or metal articulation. 
to have metal ions, we make a testing also recently with the ceramic ball heads. Why? Everyone can think, oh, with ceramic, there's no metal. In the ceramic, there's no reason to have metallic ions. We have done that because a few years ago, there was some publication claiming that with ceramic bilox delta, which is the pink material, as you know, there's some chrome oxide inside for mechanical properties and gives also these typical pink colors. They were claiming that there's some chrome release from the surface of the material. So we have done this testing in vitro with a bovine serum, as you can see on the left-hand side as a control, and we compare that with the ball heads, just put in the serum, the same ball head size between cobalt chrome and ceramic, and let them after seven days. And then we measure the ionic level of the chrome and the cobalt. As you can see for cobalt chrome heads, you have a very high increase of cobalt concentration and a little bit increase of chromium concentration compared to the control. If you look now on the ceramic on the right hand side, there was absolutely no release, no leaking of cobalt ions or chromium ions. Let me go now on the bulk material on the surface. Again, what you want to have is a, what you call appropriate inflammation and not the so-called inappropriate inflammation, meaning chronic activation of immune cells. Charging. For that, we have now the reduced bacterial adhesion. We have done also some testing, some publications. What about the reaction of the surface, the formation of the biofilm with two kinds of staphylococcus, staphylococcus epidermitis and staphylococcus aureus. And as you can see again, after 24 hours on the ceramic, again, we have using Milox Delta and Milox Forte compared to Cobalt Chrome and Nicros Polyethylene, statistically much less adhesion of the surface, much less formation of the biofilm on the surface of the ceramic. So finally, what you can say here that at the surface of the ceramic, thanks to the surface chemistry, to the very good wettability and the good protein absorption, we have less film biofilm formation at the surface cobalt compared to cobalt chrome. The question is now, until now, I've showed you a lot of in vitro studies. What does that mean now in the real world setting in the in vivo situation? Due to the limited time of my presentation, I focus now specifically on periprosthetic joint infection. As you know, the presence of an implant reduces the necessary bacteria concentration for infection by 100,000 times. We know also that in absolute value, in about 1% of primary total joint arthroplasty, we have the risk of infection. If in case of a previous infection, there's a high risk of reinfection and so on and so forth. So it's very important if you can avoid to have PGI in the total hip joint replacement. The Lan in the Lancet Journal in 2018, there was a very interesting study based from England, based of the National Joint Registry from England and Wales, with more than 600,000 patients involved in this study. The authors were in investigating different factors which may risk the cause creating PGI. Factors related to the patient, like gender, the age, BMI, and so on. Some health system factors, the place of surgery, the grade of operating, the type of operation, but also some surgical factors involving the bearing type. And what they found out on the study, some very specific factors influencing the risk of PGI. Some, some factors are patient factors. They find out that male patients have a high risk to having infections than female. Astonishingly, in this study, younger age of patients have a higher risk than older patients, elevated BMI, this one is, I think it's well known, but also by using metal bearings, you have a higher risk of having PGI. To show that on this graphic, comparing that to metal on polyethylene as a reference, let's look now at 24 months after two years. You can see that with metal on metal and ceramic on metal, which does not exist anymore on the market, we have a higher risk of having PGI compared to metal and polyethylene. But now if you avoid the presence of metal articulation for the bullets, typically, if you have ceramic on polyethylene or ceramic on ceramic, in both cases, you have a lower risk of infection. Actually, this study from NGR, as shown here, is not the only one. There are some other studies from Medicare for the USA, from Italy, Repo, from Australia, and from New Zealand, all of them showing the same consensual research outcomes. They show clearly that having ceramic components in the articulation, ceramic and polyethylene,
conclusion of my presentation, we believe that material matters. It is important to have the right choice of material if you want to have the best clinical outcomes. Ceramic have an excellent biological behavior. They have very unlikely pathogenic reactions to ceramic particles. The lowest wear of all bearing materials, highly scratch resistance. They are associated with a lower risk of revision for PGI, reduced biofilm formation compared to other bearing materials, typically cobalt chrome and polyethylene. And we believe we have a better clinical outcomes. So I come now to the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. I'm ready to answer your question. Thank you, Dr. Martin. Excellent presentation on biologs. Some of us are quite familiar with ceramics. S sorry? No, I mean, a lot of people, we all use ceramics now in India. It's quite common. Yeah. Everybody would agree that what you, what you have shown definitely is there, that ceramics have a distinct advantage over metal articulations, for sure. Okay. <laughs> I completely agree with the wear properties of uh, ceramic on ceramic and ceramic on polyarticulation. But uh, recently I read a meta-analysis about uh, the newer articulation and uh, it is saying that none of the randomized control trial has shown the superior benefit of ceramic as compared to metal in reference to periprosthetic joint infection. So, uh, your views regarding that, like the cl in clinical case scenario, the it has not yet been proven that uh, ceramic is better than metal as far as PGI is concerned. Uh, I'm not sure. Did you did you ask a question, or is your is your comment on that? Uh, I am asking like your like views on his observation. Your views on this, yeah. Like in your knowledge, are there any studies where uh, it, in clinical scenario it has been proven to be superior? Yeah, we we, we see that mainly on the on the registries, the outcome that have better outcome on the risk of PGI compared to uh, to uh, cobalt chrome. There are some studies made by uh, Parvisi, specifically showing that avoiding metallic uh, components, cobalt chrome principally you have a reduced risk of having a PGI if you have ceramic head instead. Okay. All I right. think restoring uh, the joint stability and the long-term results 10, 15 or 20 years is now well achieved with the, the modern material, especially also with high cross polyethylene. Now we have to fight some secondary risk, which is we believe PGI is some, something which more and more becomes important. And now we believe by using ceramic, that's another advantage in uh, fighting these uh, uh, causes for revision. Uh, Martin, wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, I think you are a hero of all the uh, companies where you provide your ceramic and your fourth generation ceramic is uh, really makes wonderful and we are happy to use it. Uh, two, three very common queries if you can uh, answer for the benefit of entire crowd. One is uh, uh, trunnionesis, if you can give some uh, benefit. Second is the size of the head and trunnion problem. And third thing is a squeaking problem. So three things, if you can explain for the benefit of crowd, it will be very nice from expert like you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Bosali. Uh, you know, your, your two questions merits uh, big presentations, <laughs> each of them. Yeah. So let's start with the trunionosis or fretting corrosion. Uh, it looks like it's di different publications. Some publications say that the higher size of the ball heads will create a higher risk of fretting corrosion because you have more bending and torsion forces on the taper junction of the stem, which I believe technically should happen. But it seems now, based on the retrievals analysis from Steve Kurtz, by having a ceramic ball head makes no difference on the fretting corrosion uh, depending on the head size because finally the loss of material as they observe is not coming from the taper of the ball head but it's coming mainly from the taper of the stem and this was independent of the ball head size the mess almost 10 times more loss of the material comes from the stem and uh, so sorry from the from the uh, I, re I repeat I make it wrong most of the loss of the material comes the the, the 
the taper of the ball head and not of the stem. The stem was not so much different. And the problem is by having a cobalt ball heads, then you have a lot of loss of the material coming up from the cobalt home. So I uh, start wrong my, my uh, answer, sorry. So that the loss is from the ball head. And by having a ceramic ball head, doesn't matter if the diameter of the, of the ball head does not increase the loss of the material. Now, the second question about squeaking, that was something which is uh, mainly observed in the years 2007, 2008, 2009. And as you can imagine, SRAMTEC has done a lot of studies behind that to understand more the mechanism. We came to the conclusion that's a multifactorial uh, mechanism to explain the squeaking. The main important reason was what you call the loss of the lubrication film uh, between the ball heads and the liner. And this disruption of the film can come from different uh, aspects. Typically, if you have a material particulates in between, then you create this disruption, creating the risk of uh, squeaking. And we also saw that was very specific of some design, some design coming from the cup, which has a rim, a metal rim, which with impingement created some particulates and increased the risk of squeaking. But also with a, let's say, wrong choice of material, they had some design on, out there with a stem material was called beta titanium or soft one, which adapt to the E module of the bone. It was also more prone to create fretting corrosion. And this particulate comes in that glacier and created a squeaking. So we still don't fully understand the risk of squeaking, but there's some recently, I mean, recently was now 2016, 17, meta-analysis, we said that the risk of uh, squeaking in ceramic on ceramic was about 0.3%. And the revision of that was even lower. They still have some case of squeaking that you cannot explain exactly why, but the, this is by far not the reason of revision, except if the patient is really disturbed by the by the noise. Uh, one very very, nice explanation. Yeah, Pradeep. One, one very important uh, reason for squeaking, I think, is a uh, malposition of the socket, you know. So uh, it is a very highly sensitive to the position of the components for uh, reasoning for the squeaking. So if there's a malposition, definitely the incidence of squeaking has been uh, shown to be the highest. I think you yeah, we, that's also one of the factors. If the cup is too vertical and you have uh, the load the charging loading on the edge, you yeah. have a disruption locally of the film and you have this risk of squeaking. But on the other side, you have to be careful if you have a high cross polyethylene and this is also vertical and especially with a new one, generation more thin because you want to have a large head, then you have the risk of cracking of the polyethylene. So it's... It is very... In your ceramic, when you're doing both fire, both faces ceramic, it is very important to have a proper, perfect fit and alignment because if it is not so, then a lot of problems crop up. It doesn't happen if it is a poly on the opposite side. But if it's a ceramic, then your articulation has to be absolutely perfect, degree to degree, angle to angle. Then I think you're good. But, and you know, actually, even if you are using a polyethylene component, you need to have a perfect positioning of the cup. It's maybe more permittive with a polyethylene, although with the new ceramic, the Pilox Delta, is also more uh, forgiving in the what yes. they call the stripe wear. Before, with Pilox Forte, the previous generation, and alumina, when you have two vertical cup and you have this loading there, you have a lot of stripe wear and breaking of the ceramic. That's true. That was with Bilox Forte. With Bilox Delta, it's more forgiving due to the more increased toughness. So, but in general, you need to have a good position of the cup also with polyethylene. Yes. And one last question: the largest size uh, of the head, uh, thirty-six and higher. There is not much difference, so optimum size uh, is 36. Should not go more than 36. What is your opinion? Op you mean in regard to dislocation? Uh, all the aspect. Uh, if you yeah. see 36 size A, dislocation yeah. and other issues also, cranial issues. So I, 36, I would answer like this way: for a traditional total hip atroplasty. Okay. Uh, 36 is now the standard. We can see that from our sales figures, 36 is by far the, the standard uh, ball set. And then comes 32. 28 is, does not exist any, anymore. I mean, it's very limited. And actually, we have a, we see again a restart with 28, mainly because of dual mobility. 
these 28 millimeter are used in dual mobility, but you're right, 36 is the standard size. Okay. There is some bigger size because we have some project now, again, with resurfacing on ceramic ceramics. So then we go again on the larger head size. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Welcome. Martin. Thank you, everyone. Uh, if there are no questions, then can we call it a day? Tejas? Thank you, sir. Uh, yes, we thank yes, uh, we thank our session directors and our faculties for such an interesting session and gracing us with this with their presence. Topic for session two of master's course Kesathon is how do I do my revision THR? Merrill Orthopedics would like to express immense pleasure in welcoming and introducing each of our respected session directors and eminent faculties for this session. We have with us as session director, Professor Dr. Pradeep Bosley, Director, Arthritis and Joint Replacement Surgery, Nanavati Super Specialty Hospital, Mumbai. He has performed more than 16,000 surgeries in 35 years of his vast experience. Professor Dr. Pradeep Bosley has to his credit numerous trainings and fellowships internationally. He has an expertise in revision hip and knee replacement surgeries, robotic and computer-assisted TKR, minimally invasive, high flexion TKR, corrective surgery, and arthritis with deformities. He has received various awards for his extensive work in orthopedic specialty. Recently, he has received the Golden AIM Conference Award 2021. He has been a founding member of ISHKS. Professor Dr. Pradeep Bhusle, Medical Orthopedics welcomes you to Master's Course Kesathon. We have with us as session director, Dr. Dimple Parekh, Director and Chief Department of Joint Replacement, Parikh's Hospital, Ahmedabad. Dr. Parikh has performed 12,000 joint replacement surgeries till now. Dr. Parikh is a pioneer in surface replacement surgeries in Gujarat, PSI, robotic joint replacement surgery, and computer-assisted hip and knee surgeries. He has received numerous awards for his extensive work in the field of orthopedics. He has more than 10 published papers to his accomplishments. Dr. Dimple Parikh, Medical Orthopedics welcomes you to Master's Course Kesathon. We have with us as faculty, Colonel Dr. Jatin Sood, Professor and Head of Department Orthopedics, Armed Forces Medical College, Pune. He has numerous fellowships and training programs to his credit. Dr. Sood has eight national and international publications and 80 academic presentations to his accomplishments. Colonel Dr. Jatin Sood, Medical Orthopedics welcomes you to Master's Course Kesathon. We have with us as faculty, Dr. Shailendra Patil, Managing Director and Consultant, Joint Replacement, Aditi Hospital, Mumbai. Dr. Patil has special expertise in shoulder and elbow replacement, sports surgery, revision, joint surgeries, tissue preserving surgeries, and minimally invasive TKR, THR, and UKR. He has various research papers and publications to his credit. Dr. Shailendra Patil, Merit Orthopedics welcomes you to Master's Course, Kesathon. <coughs> We have with us as a faculty, Dr. Rutul Gandhi, Consultant Joint Replacement Surgeon, Ames Hospital, Ahmedabad. He has performed about 2,500 joint replacement surgeries with 150 revision surgeries. Dr. Gandhi has 10 national and international publications to his accomplishments. Dr. Rutul Gandhi, Medical Orthopedics welcomes you to Master's Course Kesathon. We also have with us as faculty, Professor Dr. Benia Horia, Associate Professor, Cluj University Hospital, Romania. His areas of interest are nanotechnologies in regeneration of bone tissue and osseointegration of implants, as well as new surgical approaches and procedures for knee, shoulder, and ankle. He has received various awards for his work in orthopedic specialty. He has one book and 32 articles published in international journals. Professor Dr. Benya Horia, Medical Orthopedics welcomes you to Master's Course Kesathon. We also have with us as faculty, Dr. Kartik Patel, Consultant Joint Replacement Surgeon, Shalya Orthopedic Hospital, Ahmedabad. Dr. Patel has to his credit various fellowships and training programs internationally. Dr. Kartik Patel, Medical Orthopedics welcomes you to Master's Course Kesathon. Dr. Martin Zimmerman will also join us as faculty for this session as well. With this, I respect our uh, with this, I request our respected session directors, Professor Dr. Pratik Posle and Dr. Dimple Parekh, to kindly take over the session from here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. That's a wonderful faculty. And uh, without wasting our time, there are six presenters. 
So I'll invite uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Sooth to present his case. Hello. 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 Can I, am I audible there? Yeah. Yeah, you are audible. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I thank uh, the organizers for this opportunity. And uh, I bring my greetings from AFMC, Pune. So I primarily was a arthroplasty surgeon, but now I'm in more of the academic uh, thing of it. But anyway, this uh, presentation is about uh, the metal on metal hip replacement surgery. And my story with one of the patients that I had with a very early metal on metal cases where I do it. So the story, these are my affiliations and uh, uh, I have no disclosures. So this is about my uh, patient when I was quite much, much early. This is the year 2006. He's an infantry soldier, 2005, uh, 25 years of age, very active, and actually a hairdresser, you know, but still he has to be active because he's in the infantry. And he's presented with the, about a one year onset of hip pain on the right side and absolutely nothing on the left side. We suspected the uh, evascular necrosis. He had a uh, reduction of movements and probably he just gone into the second uh, type two or of, had sustained a fracture, though, which he needed. He had a lot of pain. So we initially wanted to manage him with conservative and after five to six months, he did not kind of relent. He was disturbed by it and he wanted an intervention and diagnosis. We did an MRI at that time, but I'm, I don't have the MRI right now. But there was uh, stage uh, three uh, on the right side and left when we took up for surgery. Anyway, with this background, young person, 25 years of age, we had to do something good for him. Literature was a flush with the lot of information about metal on metal, how it is so great for the young and is the best for the young people and how the survivor shape. Little concern about metal ions. We've been recently been trained on the resurfacing <clears throat> with Derek Metman himself. So we decided that we should go do something good for him. So we selected the best thing which was there for him. That was 2006, which is a metal on metal large diameter head. Extremely large diameter head, very low dislocation rates, good function, little bit concern of cobalt chrome. We discussed everything with him. Pseudo tumor was something which was not known to us at that time. So we had concerns about cobalt chrome. We had everything was explained to him and he kind of opted for this. And we did. On the left side, we did not do anything. He was having no symptoms on that side. We put him on medical treatment for evascular necrosis. Okay. Post surgery, I think he was one of the happiest patients. Six weeks, he was sitting cross-legged. We were also mighty thrilled about it. Had near, near, almost near normal hip function. So there are all old excess, sorry for the quality. And he was pain-free. He had good function. He was really satisfied. And even on the left side, his symptoms, which were very less, even improved further. So let's go. That is 2006. Then we had been in touch. I had some follow-up. It's 2018. When I was in uh, Delhi, in the, uh, you know, the, it's a very large uh, arthroplasty center in Army Hospital RR. When this soldier again pops up, he was absolutely asymptomatic at that time. And he actually came for clearance so that he could uh, go for uh, foreign operational deployment. You know? So he was pretty much good in shape, absolutely asymptomatic. He was pretty much good, good in good category. So all he wanted was a clearance for an operational uh, deployment. On examination, this is 2018, this is about 12 years later. He didn't have any physical examination. Right side, there was a heel scar, very good movement. If you can see this, 120 degree flexion, full reduction. He was sitting cross-legged. He even said he plays games. And that was the situation. But knowing the background that he had something which has been recalled in 2010, we wanted to investigate him further. So this is the situation he came in. Even if you look at the left hip, he was in very bad state. Probably he had sustained come thun, come up, congregated there. He was pain-free on that side and was not seeking treatment on the left side. He was only coming for clearance for being deployed over. That has got some laboratory benefit also. So this was the situation. Uh, he came with this x-ray, knowing we, I knew it because I had operated on him in about 12 years back, that he has an implant which has been recalled and he had a stem which is a you know, diaphyseal fixation stem, I mean, so the medulloid locking stem, that's the AML. So with this background, we kind of did his investigations, trying to find out what was the reason. The cup was very well aligned. That's the balanced 
principal balance, minimum strain balance, which was there. Leg length was good. He had some issues about a little bit of, we thought it maybe, maybe because of the stress, stress shielding, because of this extremely porous coated stem that we had used at that time. And some slight doubt here in the sorcil area, which could be could be metallosis or induced. Even. But then there was the soft tissue shadow in the groin area, which we noticed actually retrospectively. So with these backgrounds, we did a cobalt chrome test you know, where we investigated for cobalt chrome and found the levels to be not very high. You know, they were high. So you see the cutoff is usually 5.5 in the UK and different in the UK and the US. But given these levels, with five times the cutoff, it was high and it was a cause of concern. So having with, with all this background, we wanted to discuss with the because do because remember that he was asymptomatic. He did not come for treatment. He actually came for upgradation. So next step was to evaluate him. That was to do an MRI. That's a Mars MRI. Uh, Mars MRI uh, was done, a three Tesla MRI we did. And that was something which really raised our eyebrows. There was a large pseudo tumor sitting in the anterior aspect, which was, uh, you know, which was the one which he had a little bit of groin pain at times, something in the posterior aspect. And, uh, you know, by and large, it was all around the hip. With these things, uh, that's another thing. Uh, this was the most worrisome area that there was a shadow sitting right in front of the hip in the groin area, inferior aspect of the hip joint. Got all his investigations there, the labs are normal, the CRP was not raised, the ESR was not raised. But that's it, you know. So with this background, I this is the background we had, and and this state, we want we we were, we were like in a fix. So what to, should we do with this patient? So should I stop here to ask uh, what the faculty would like to say? So these are the problems we could uh, think about. Firstly, which hip should we address? Secondly, there was a taper issue. Now this AML stem is nine by ten taper, and most of the tapers that we have today are twelve by fourteen or ten by V forty. And uh, metallosis was certainly there. There was a the, uh, pseudo tumor. And secondly, the revision surfaces, which revision surface, when we revise from a metal on metal, what hard surface should we do? Metal on poly, should we use a ceramic on poly, ceramic on ceramic? And what are we going to do if we have to remove the stem and there is a is there, which was expected? And uh, the other big concern was, was a fully coated metal only locking stem, the AML. And it is known that it kind of just fixes there. So these were our challenges. And uh, with this background, uh, I'll probably ask if anybody in the audience or the faculty would say, how should we go about this case? Hello. Yes, uh, it is open for uh, all the faculties or anything. So let's see, I mean, let me take it. Since it was a... Uh, Metallosis we saw on the X-ray and the metal ion which was high on the blood. We have to do a revision and probably we'll have to address that particular hip. A revision would be a primary thing that then the uh, the opposite hip we need to do. So that you no, know, I mean obviously he requires a revision surgery. My preference is to uh, revise. Uh, I mean the taper because this is a typical metallosis from the taper. So yeah. we have to change the uh, femoral component as well. Mm -hmm. Here there is no, I mean, we'll have to take out the cup as well as we'll, we'll have to do our extended trochanteric costetomy and uh, do the revision surgery. And uh, we try to take out all the metallosis, whatever we can take it out. That would be the choice and we'll send it for the histopatho. No, I agree. You know, the, all these things were playing on our mind and there were no definite things. So basically we had to cater for almost everything for a revision. And uh, the biggest, hardest part was to convince him to get the revision work because he did not have any problem. So uh, you see, then, then obviously it takes a lot of opinion. So if you see this chart, we had to prepare it and show it to him something of this sort, that this is where we are. You know, He got it in 2006 when it was only 12 cases reported uh, with the FDA complaints. Actually, it is the Australian registry which reported the pseudo tumor. And uh, then it's only in 2010 August when finally the thing went out of hand at the middle then the implant was withdrawn when the cases started rising so much. But unfortunately, uh, this is a condition and uh, the failure rate and after having explained to him, he understood he was leaving an opportunity to go abroad and serve. Many things were there. 
and of course it could have been very destructive with this time as you know people who have used aml uh, you know three weeks down the line it's difficult to get it out anyway with all these statistics okay. we sorry yeah please okay. with this statistics we kind of prepared him to undergo the surgery and uh, he was uh, kind of very not very convinced later till till the time of the surgery since i had done the first case so probably that was a probably a good correction i made with him and um, plan of surgery so we planned for him for a revision for this side first this was still uh, i mean it was comparatively it was not the good hip the good hip was still was the one which was a destroyed hip this was a troubled hip so we took out uh, plan to take out the cup remove the pseudo tumor and also look for as as you said it was expected the femoral implant will be affected but still we wanted to take it as a last option in case required we may you know use a taper adapter which we in uh, like fortunately in that center we had some imported many years back they were not sterile but still we kind of sterilized them and kept them for an emergency in case we found there was no tendinosis it was just limited to the edge of the implant so we kept that also a biable adapter which was 9 10 to 12 15 that's a universal adapter and of course kept a distal fixation stem so with this uh, very lucky to take out the cup straight away with very less bone loss eventually i you know we took this out and i could put a 58 uh, stem bone loss there was minimal bone loss in the stem so first part of the surgery went very well it was great next is to take the pseudo tumor out it was right in between the groin if you can see this rubbery kind of a material you know it is all rubbery material which is going deep into the groin area around the estabulum and also into the sorcel area so that has eventually pulled out slowly and we had good indication from that mri or nice mri was done the stem doesn't look very good but i'll show you a better photograph of this so that's the entire pseudo tumor taken out and only a part of it it had wide spread was wide spread no doubt about that histopath report stem it reported a chronic inflammatory uh, tissue which is commensurate to this but after having removed the stem uh, sorry the cup which was which i was very happy i still was unhappy about this because this is what we had at the stem at at hand there was lot of metal debris at the collar you know and this, there were also tenosis there as uh, somebody in the faculty just said dr dimpal parekh i think and if you see i wanted to highlight that coronus is just as if this entire thing that's the taper sleeve and as if it has been welded to it it was completely welded so that's the kind of corrosion which takes place and it was absolutely very messy inside lot of tissue loss also took place that was another of our concern if you remove too much of tissues and the aml stem will always take a toll on its bone so offset options will become less in distal fixation stems that was one of our concerns eventually it was a very destructive surgery taking out an aml lateral side is still okay after an eto this is after an eto but taking out the medial side i'll show you the post of exit it is extremely destructive taking out this stem very uh, lot of blood loss transfusions and that's what we landed up with putting a wagner had to reattach the trochanter again back and whatever was left the bone pieces is simply some part of it was still there but because of the muscle muscle uh, the you know the muscles it was not come, coming close to the stem so this is at best i could do at that stage he had lots lot of blood by that time this is what it looked like um, initially we were very skeptical should we make him walk but he himself was quite confident and by 3 weeks he started putting weight but this was the condition that's the old uh, you know our workhouse the wagner which we are very very confident of and in at time we even used in proximal tumor surgeries as long as the sleeve is preserved so his leg length issues were a little bit there but i was confident i can sort it out once i do the next hip you know so that was not the issue but we try to get maximum i had to kind of lengthen this leg normally than normal so that the soft tissue tension could be you know the soft tissue tension on the trochanteric vastus lateralis sleeve could be restored these are the follow up after 2018 i think that's 2019 he had this similar kind of fracture he's been followed up now and in 2018 he had this then in 2019 he went back to work in a protective kind of a atmosphere where he was looking after the canteen you know as a supervisor this is where the service held him he was taken out of active duties and he was as you can see smiling he's happy and in 2019 he comes back for his other hip 
and did that and he collapsed his leg length that's in june 2019 approximately a year after we revised him that's something in 2010 so the entire bone as long as the vascularity was there now you can see that it is all in last two years a little more than that it's all bridging up right up to there okay there is a deficiency but the entire bridge which i did not hope we are still coming back and this is what he sent to me on june 2021 not a very clear exit that he he collected of his own but this is where we are getting so we have a continuous bone bridge on the medial side which where he had the maximum loss the other thing was that definitely he was compensated well i had to do a lot of uh, communication with the the company and he got fair amount of compensation for his uh, problem because he had two things to it firstly there was no mix and match of the implants it was a debutant thing secondly he had all the records with him we had all the records which are retrieved from him thirdly it was less than 15 years he was just short of 15 years he was two years short of 15 years after in 15 years he would have not got a penny he is well compensated now so this is his present condition this is he sent it to me yesterday he is on leave at his village he has about 2 and 1/2 cm of residual wasting but his leg length is now equal he performs now he is upgraded back to his actual job instead of a, a protected thing and uh, this is what he looks like today that's his video from yesterday both sides done and uh, i am very happy that he's got a similar leg length and there's no rotation which i was i have expected him to have an external rotational kind of a problem but he's done so well so far a uh, fantastic uh, case you have worked out very well you have done wonderful surgery and uh, the pre op planning was superb you have done wonderful work up and uh, demonstrated uh, the uh, alval and uh, there is only one option is only revision don't look at the opposite yeah. side and uh, only one small thing uh, you could have used little longer stem for revision mm -hmm. but anyway it was holding well so i heart, hardly i uh, hearty congratulations for wonderful job fantastic yes sir thank you so much sir i think there was this is a 14 to 65 stem you know and uh, i don't think i had a longer than that that day so we had good inventory and this probably we had managed that day and uh, we went for wagner you know because uh, somehow in my center there we had a lot of confidence on this compared to even a distal fixing like a reef or something like that we find it really works very well it's our workhorse you know it's a it's the salvage tool for us and one more important message this explant is a wonderful in Excellent. instrument you know i mean uh, we are so happy we bought it and any kind of uh, fix osteo integrated cup it is like a butter you can really remove without uh, removing extra bone so it's a wonderful in instrument and it is available with the company also they give it on hire zimmer i am talking about and other companies also which uh, explant is this this zimmer this zimmer, zimmer yeah wonderful in instrument so it's, 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 it's very zimmer. easy <laughs> very easy to remove any osteo integrated or even cemented cup and we are very happy with it and even the stem is wonderful stem lot of similar stems are coming up in the market Yeah. very uh, wonderful stem with a good option right. fantastic job i think uh, what i wanted to kind of impress upon this is because uh, uh, is that you know it was my initial enthusiasm in probably 2006 when things came in and uh, you know we want to do the best and in that process though it was it was nothing wrong with it, the way the went it went for everybody like that but maybe we should be a little bit skeptical about new implants and uh, of course everything depends the literature was pro for it was for him at that time but uh, anyway it has one, gone up well one so. one very important message to all of uh, that even asymptomatic patient hardly see lot of osteolysis but metal on metal uh, this is a problem and everybody should work out the way you have done this you should do mri do uh, chromium and uh, all the uh, blood I levels know. yes so this is very wonderful and you should always suspect in metal on metal cases So when we have done a surface replacement of 300 cases and metal on metal more than two. Not cases. every case uh, happens. Uh, but like then this. still we did it for every case just because of this 2010 it came uh, as a recall. Yeah. So we contacted everybody and we got uh, this uh, done. 
when frankly speaking uh, surface replacement patients are doing extremely well still today they are not i mean they don't have metallosis and they are happy yeah i agree i think uh, it should come back but it should come back with better metallurgy yes <laughs> because it's uh, the results are excellent for that. i think ceramic is working on it maybe so uh, finally let's hope for the best yeah thank you next speaker please dr Next shailendra faculty. patel yes yeah. dr shailendra good afternoon everyone i think we should thank meril because you know there is something happening orthopedic since last 10 or 12 days you know every one of us is you know arranging acting like a physician and arranging beds and medicines for our relatives and near and dear ones okay so i'll i'll try to take you know in a short time two or three cases so uh, please uh, you know i'll just try to finish two or yeah, three be, cases be brief and uh, to a message uh, is very important yeah uh, the first case is uh, the 72 year old gentleman Uh, suffering from the TIA, that is transgenic ischemic attacks. Uh, I had operated some three or four years back bilateral total knee stage total knee on it. He has a fall at home and he developed an intertrochanteric fracture, which was very well done, fixed by one of our senior uh, uh, consultant, Dr. Patak, uh, at our hospital. Patient was happy, uh, moved around, and had a fall at home, and he came with them such some you know some kind of uh, this kind of X-ray picture. uh then we admitted him investigated on him uh, it was difficult to plan a, get a medical fitness for him but still we managed the planning was implant removal so we asked for the primary implant uh, uh, company extraction removal rate uh, removal set and then we planned a total hip replacement i arranged for a monolog distal loading implant the idea was to bypass the distal locking stress riser which i usually acts as a stress riser with adequate length and to get an adequate uh, good stability in such cases because of the intertrochanteric fracture so stability a uh, post surgery thr is a big issue in such cases so on post surgery i got this kind of uh, x ray picture patient was happy we mobilized him patient was happy went home stitches were out after one month everyone was doing well after six months patient had again you know fall and uh, you know we arranged a home x ray and we got something like this so actually patient at that time developed a, a fracture starting from the distal locking screw which was quite oblique and spiral and oblique fracture so at this stage you know what are the options which we have and Dr. Patil, can you go back one slide and show us the post-op X-ray? Yeah. yeah, basically this has happened uh, post-trauma. You said, but there was already a stress riser the whole. So that's a standard rule which uh, everybody should follow is to bypass those stress uh, at least two cortical diameter. should be distal to the stress riser is a standard rule so this has occurred post traumatic yeah yeah then the, the option was you know like again the fitness was an issue for him because of his uh, internal carotid structure or the vertebral artery structure but still we manages and on radiologically the cuff was looking stable the hip was looking stable even the femoral component was looking stable so we planned for the plating we did a minimally you know uh, mipo type of you know plating and the only thing which i didn't get a good purchase on the proximal fragment but uh, i used a double ss square from ao and got only three cortices above but uh, patient was in bed for at least one and one and a half month and was on the pth and calcium and vitamin d and with active exercises we started mobilizing him now almost one year after this thing but there is no you know call from the patient for this thing and he is working on it so one important message here is a, a long plate segment that's very important so that really helps to balance the uh, torque and liver arm 
the only uh, question to sir is uh, why you know he has developed the fracture even though you know we had a good purchase distally uh, no you said quite trauma long, long time 6 to 8 months after the you know the primary surgery it's a trauma i think trauma it can happen uh, any question so the basic uh, rule is try to uh, put longer try to avoid those stress riser protect the stress riser so that uh, it definitely helps you have done partly but still a little more would have done better but it was fracture because of the trauma fall oh. coming to the second case you know it was uh, one of the bad days you know where i really got stuck in this case uh it's a 40 to 8 years old female lady complains of the you know deformity of the right leg which was short since as patient and relative narrated it was since childhood patient walks with a short limb gait then again you know when we calculated it was almost 5 cm shortening after so many years of you know this thing patient has become a symptomatic on the daily activity like fatigue and thigh pain and the you know back pain she was developing and now they are demanding for the surgery Uh, they came with this X-ray picture. You know, we try to get an AP and lateral view. Uh, I try to do you know some uh, matching on the opposite side, which was usually coming forty-eight uh, size of uh, acetabulum on the opposite side. Then I planned it for uh, after consulting with the patient. You know, uh, I planned it for. Uh, So they are totally given an option of total hip surgery, surgery with an uh, you know uh, explaining them the complication of sciatic nerve injury, the abductor lurch even after the surgery because of the uh, acute stretch uh, stretching of the abductor muscles, uh, and the porotic nature of the you know the especially on the acetabular side. So my real challenge while operating was the acetabular side, which came as a thirty-eight or forty on the first go. the anterior wall the floor was paper thin even she was deficient on superior lateral side superior wall was you know very deficient and the osteoporosis the bone on the femur side was quite uh, strong enough but proximal part of the neck and the proximal intertrochanteric part was sclerotic though the distal part was quite you know healthy i did a sro I did a subtrochanteric osteotomy, and I used that head as a bone graft fixed with the two CC screws. The real problem came when the size forty mm size head was acetabulum was not available. The next good size available was forty four, and that with the multi hole company. i had kept two companies implant inventory ready for the surgery one from the femoral you know the, uh, this srom and uh, another from the merilo the 44 i choose 44 because it was multi hole because i don't have any coverage in the superior part and i put two you know bone graft and screws there so multi hole and i put i try to put a two screws uh, in the in this thing then i use a ceramic on ceramic in this as was well, that was the demand from the patient patient was doing good i mobilized him you know th- three or four third or fourth day the patient was washing watching with partial with toe touch with bearing and we planned it it discharge on the 8th 7th or 8th day and the day of the discharge patient started complaining of pain in the hip region and there was mild swelling there was no history of fall or nothing patient has done all her regular activities one night prior we did the x ray and as you know everyone the most common complication in such cases is the anterior dislocation of the hip joint so till now you know any questions on this and how 
In these cases, what we do is we just try to put the acetabular component in the best position and then the femoral component is kept accordingly. SROM has an advantage that you can uh, put the femoral component in uh, whatever direction you want to kick. So that is the advantage of uh, SROM. But sir, there are so many practical issues with the implant. The, in, the trial implant doesn't give you do that good fit and so you do, don't get that desired trial of uh, you know hip replacement because it is so loose in the distal part so you really don't get that you know uh, you don't really identify what uh, degree of you know uh, uh, version i want on the femoral side so that that is a really good you know big issue on table with the complaint implant company Cleave and stem would be of different sizes. So, you know, stem distally will also have some fixation and then the, the trial part would the, be... The in, final implant has a fantastic, fantastic, yes. uh, uh, you know, the purchase. But the trial implant is something loose, you know, you don't have control over it. And then the other option is you have to go one size above. But actually it is a three millimeter more, which True. is again, so you know, you might better. land up... Settering the femur. Yeah. So what we have to do is we have to put it in a best position and then you'll have to mark it on the uh, osteotomized uh, femur uh, this study and then you have to put the stem accordingly and the proximal part will have a which approach you have done this posterior approach yeah yeah, yeah in this case i had put in more uh, version to the cup because i you know, while retracting and this thing, I had got a crack on the paper thin anterior cortex. So, and I have put a, a bone graft on the superior and the posterior side. So, I have to get more purchase for the cup. I have to more antivert it. So, my other option was to give a less version on the femoral side, which I tried it my best. So, so what is what I planned is, you know, I, the real challenge was to should I go for revise everything, go and revise everything or should I change only the cup or should I change and only revise the stem? Uh, whenever there is a dislocation, first thing is you must uh, do all the work up to identify and not do any guesswork. You, know? you must do a CT, find out what is the version of the stem, what is the version of the socket. That is absolutely necessary on 3D CT. And then you can go. You can't just assume things and uh, go ahead for dislocation. So you must have a pre-plan and then go ahead. Being a primary surgeon, as I said, I had given in more version to the this thing. I had reduced. Tried no, to reduce after, after dislocation, yeah. any dislocation case, this okay. is the basic thing. You must identify the problem, why it has dislocated. So first thing is the component uh, alignment. So must have proper CT record and demonstrate there is something uh, wrong. And then you can think about changing. Okay. So that's CT absolute necessary. Done. Yeah. CT was not done. Sir. Yeah. Okay. So as I was knowing this, you know, I changed the uh, poly from ceramic. I taken out the ceramic poly for the same. And I had put in uh, polythene poly with 20 degree lip. I had just changed the direction of the lip and put it in anterior anteriorly because that was the only option which was available because on the acetabular sign, even going for a cage and construct, you know, it, it starts with 48 or some 50, you know, sizes, which was not, you know, possible in this case. Cemented cup was not possible in this case. Taking out this cup and uh, again putting it back as I was the one who has got the primary you know the first hand he feel of the the bones and quality so it was not the option so I changed it to the uh, uh, change the poly and uh, you know the reverse the direction of the leaf and which cup is this is a defu cup then you yep. can use yep. even the constraint liner if alignment is okay Again, sir, constraint liner at 40 per size, I think it is not, not available as per the company guys. It starts, they say, some starts some from, from 48 or 50. 
and version everything on the intraop it was now uh, now this is the 3 week 3 months post op patient is doing well walking on it but still you you see is using his uh, one stick and walker you know put a was put on complete bed rest for one month one and one and one and a half month and put on tp again teriparatide and you know all other dr patel one quick question yes, uh, like dr bosle just pointed out did you assess on table as to what was the uh, issue why did the uh, dislocation happen did you did, could you assess on the it table? was the virgin sir virgin virgin on both the side acetabulo component was more anti inverted and the I had a choice of removing the femoral implant and putting it into lens some ten or ten fifteen degrees less version or this thing. But I choose the option of you know putting on poly uh, with extended leaf. It was stable uh, intraoperatively. Yeah, it, till till date it is stable almost three three and a half months. Excellent. is there any time or should i yeah yeah, yeah i think uh, we go to the next yeah, okay, if i can ask a question is it possible <laughs> hello yeah hello i just wanted to this is dr vikas in uh, this is dr vikas in from indore so i was just wondering what about the inclination is in the inclination a bit uh, lesser after you have uh, just seen the poly in the x-ray uh, virgin was one thing what about the inclination also if you really rotate this view i think inclination is inclination is okay is it okay yeah. yeah it looks okay inclination is okay the pelvis is still there the table it so was it frank looks, anterior yeah. dislocation it was a virgin problem so you compensated with the elevated poly good yeah. job fine because it's very cumbersome to remove the socket and change the socket in a compromised cdh situation thank you very much wonderful Thanks. case uh, next next uh, faculty please Who is the next faculty on the? Uh, Dr. Patel, uh, you will have to stop sharing the screen to allow me to share. Yeah, I'll do that. Yes, hello, hello. I am uh, Dr. Benya from uh, Cluj Napoca, Romania. I will be the next uh, speaker. I will share yes. my presentation. It is uh, a pleasure for me to be here. I thank uh, very much the Merrill guys for inviting me here. It's uh, Uh, it's a pleasure to see all these interesting cases uh, we were thinking that uh, in romania we have uh, a lots of uh, <laughs> ugly CDH. cases let's say but uh, i see that you in uh, in your country you have uh, you are overcoming us in um, in this uh, in this uh, matter so i work in cluj napoca it's the second uh, largest center in uh, in romania and we are here at the eastern gate of the european union this is my uh, hospital i work it's the orthopedic and traumatology clinic from cluj napoca and this is my university where i am associate professor so i prepared the presentation with uh, a few cases uh, to show uh, what we are doing in romania in uh, my center i didn't insist in a particular case uh, so maybe i will uh, i will go through all the cases and maybe if you have any question please uh, please address them to me so uh, the uh, revision hip arthroplasty does not have uh, such good results as the primary uh, primary hip arthroplasty Uh, it implies a longer surgery time and increased blood loss and risk of infection increased complications as we all know so what i we have to emphasize is on the importance of correct completion of primary total hip replacement so there are a few cases of uh, revision hip arthroplasty first is the aseptic loosening that we can deal with implant failure recurrent dislocation pjis or periprosthetic fractures 
Uh, septic loosening must always be suspected when we see on the X-ray an increased bone resorption, uh, an uh, irregular uh, endosteal surface, an elevated periosteum, and of course, uh, increased levels of serum inflammation markers in, uh, in the blood. Uh, first case is a 63-year-old woman with uh, non cemented total hip replacement, but with, uh, which uh, got infected. It was, it was operated on another service and sent to us. In the first stage, we have done an implant removal, debridement, and antibiotic loaded spacer, and then uh, systemic therapy. And after six months, we can deal with the second stage space removal and modular uh, revision total hip arthroplasty that we are this is the usual way we are doing in uh, in the in uh, hip uh, in pjis uh, next thing would be a periprosthetic fractures that are often produced after a minor trauma uh, it uh, it can be on uh, pre-existent osteolytic lesions undiagnosed that is why we are uh, trying to recall all the patients to annual controls in order to detect early these osteolytic lesions. Uh, most of the patients have uh, surgical in with uh, these fractures have surgical indication because the conservative treatment does not lead to any good results. And still with this, the pseudarthrosis rate is still elevated. A few cases regarding this uh, type of pathology. First, it's a male, 69 years old which uh, suffered a uh, fracture, periprosthetic fracture, and we have revised the stem and the, the cup with a modular total, uh, modular total hip. We are uh, very fond of these uh, modular uh, revision stems. Another case, it's a 81-year-old woman with a, with a stem penetration on a cemented total hip and uh, which uh, got loosened, of course, and then we revised, uh, but only the stem with a longer stem, modular type again. Another case, a 77-year-old woman with, uh, who suffered a periprosthetic fracture, uh, failed osteosynthesis, and then we had to revise the stem with uh, modular, uh, of course, with a distal, Loading, uh, loading stem in order to surpass the, the, the weak point of the diaphysis. Another case, a 65-year-old woman with, uh, who suffered the periprosthetic fractures, operated, but due to the, the aseptic loosening of the stem and cup, we had to revise it with uh, an anatomic uh, modular uh, stem fixed with, uh, with distal uh, locking screws. And of course, changement of the, the acetabular cup with the non cemented one. And then uh, another case, uh, uh, this time in these locations, uh, 58 year old male with, uh, with a revision after, uh, after multiple dislocation. Uh, so we have just revised the, the stem, putting a, a dressing with a with a distal loading and a changement of, uh, of a version for this. Another uh, woman who got, uh, who got a primary implant with a slight, uh, only very small positioning of the stem, but uh, she was very unhappy and uh, accused of the pain in the, in the, in the hip. So we, after analyzing the, the position of the components, we have decided to change only the stem and uh, put uh, put uh, another type of stem with uh, with uh, better positioning, and she was very well after that. Another problem are the acetabular bone stock deficiencies, uh, with uh, in which case uh, morselized bone grafts can we can use for filling the acetabular wall, but in cases of great defects. We can appeal to massive structural grafting, or if not available, trabecular metal cones or metallic reinforcement. Uh, in these cases, an uncemented cup would represent the best option in case of sufficient bone stock in order to ensure st stability. A larger and longer femoral component must be chosen in order to obtain a good contact in the distal part of the femoral diaphysis 
for optimal mechanical load bearing thus by, by, bypassing the proximal destroyed zones. A few examples uh, in these cases, uh, we have a male, 61 years old, with an acetabular component revision after defixation in which we have uh, uh, changed it with uh, and, uh, and uh, replace it with a cage and, of course, a cemented cup in it with, uh, with uh, good results after that. Another case, this was uh, a 51 year old, very young woman uh, who had uh, a revision, uh, a first revision of the cup initially done in another service, but uh, uh, the primary implant was on uh, was on uh, on a developmental dysplasia of the hip. And the acetabular component, we have re-revised it after the cage defixation and dislocation, as we can see in the left picture. And we have managed to insert the small uncemented cup in the, in the, in the neocotyl and using also a bone grafting from the iliac crest in order to ensure the, 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 the apex of the cup with a good stability. And she is uh, very well now. She's doing very well. Another woman, 55 years old, with a revision of the acetabular component with cage and a cemented cup after a septic loosening of the first implant uh, done. On the other hip, we see she has, uh, she has uh, arthrodesis uh, practicing in the, in the early young age. Another case of a 65 years old uh, man with an acetabular component, uh, first revision with uh, uncemented cup, but uh, failed again. So we have to re revise it with a cage, and uh, it's a Bert Schneider uh, type of cage and a cemented cup in it. Another case, a 79-year-old woman with, uh, on the left side with uh, a revision of the hip uh, primary arthroplasty after a septic loosening on a cemented one. And we have, uh, we have changed it with a cemented stem and an acetabular cage with a cemented cup. Another uh, woman of 83 years old with a left side acetabular revision with a cage and a cemented cup after a septic loosening of the of the of the cage with a dislocation and then she uh, uh, two years after she suffered a periprosthetic femoral fracture which we have treated with uh, with um, osteosynthesis by um, by proximal femoral plating Okay, uh, another uh, woman of 70 years old with a, a dislocation of, an of a cemented shell after with a, sep with a septic loosening and dislocation which we revised it with, a, with an uncemented cup and screw. Okay, then uh, 85 years, year old uh, woman who had, uh, uh, who had uh, suffered a femoral neck fracture. Uh, she was operated in another service uh, uh, one year uh, previously with uh, partial, uh, partial endoprosthesis, the Moore Thompson type. There are centers that still use, uh, use this type of prosthesis. And she came to us, uh, she had a, she had a, uh, irradiation disease for a bladder carcinoma uh, and uh, after that on the osteo local osteoporosis she suffered a, a protrusion of the of the implant in the acetabulum that we had to revise it with uh, with a cemented cage and with a cemented cup on a, on a reinforcement cage and also a cemented stem which she is doing very well so in a revision total hypertroplasty being very difficult, uh, it, leads, it can lead to poor results. So we, the literature estimates up to 20% of infection rate, 29% of failures at eight year and with a 5% uh, of the uh, uh, Yes. The time is very limited. 
Could yes, I will conclude? stop now. Yeah, because course. there are four speakers. Yes, I know. I, this is uh, this will be my last slide. Thank yeah. you very much, and uh, it's a very interesting uh, conference here. Yeah. I will stop. stop Thank sharing. you very much. Wonderful Thank cases. You. We enjoyed. One small question: uh, yes. uh, modular uh, revision stem. Uh, they are known to have a high failure at the junction. You know, it has been well documented, and it is almost uh, going. Out of the, your I know. Uh, your monoblock is always better. I know, but this is our favorite for the moment. We will change from now. We will. Uh, these are our cases that we have done in the past few years. Past. So oh, we okay. will. Uh, yes, we will change now from the for the monoblock. Until Thank now, uh, it's uh, my cases and also my other colleagues cases yeah. in the. Service. Thank you very much. Wonderful uh, exposures. May I invite the next speaker, please, faculty? Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah. So today uh, I'll be speaking about the role of dual mobility hip in uh, revision totally pathoplasty. One of uh, I'll be speaking about one of my cases. And uh, to start off, uh, the dual mobility concept is a unique concept which was developed around 40, 45 years back by Gilles Bouquet and Raoul Lambay, and it was a combination of two. Uh, two uh, concepts, that is the low friction arthroplasty concept by Chan Chanli, and, uh, which reduces the wear and low dislocation with a large femoral head concept by Mackey and Ferrer. Yeah, please uh, try to be short because sure. we are really uh, passing the time. Okay, okay, sir. So this is the case. So it, uh, he's a 72 year old male patient. The case is similar to Dr. Chetan Sud. Uh, he, he has been operated with a metal on metal hip earlier, around approximately 12 years back. And now he has started developing pain in the operated hip. It is insidious in onset and uh, it is uh, increasing day by day. Uh, he can feel a localized swelling around the hip joint and the, uh, the walking distance is decreasing day by day. There are uh, no fever or other constitutional symptoms. So we uh, investigated him for the reason for this problem. And uh, at that time we were uh, uh, knowing this complication of the metal on metal hip. So uh, we, we did the uh, blood reports of uh, cobalt and chromium levels. Uh, the X-ray, uh, it suggested that the stem was well fixed. There was no change in the component position when uh, uh, when compared with the previous old X-rays. And some lytic areas were seen around the acetabulum. A metal subsection MRI was also done, uh, which suggested a soft tissue mass or an alval kind of a pseudotumor reaction uh, with fluid collection and a muscle edema mm -hmm. around the hip joint. Mm. And this was the kind of the picture we uh, saw, which, uh, you know, confirmed the diagnosis of uh, metallosis uh, on opening of the hip. So we did a revision uh, of the, we did a thorough debridement. We debrided all the tissue which was uh, found to be uh, damaged with, uh, due to metallosis. The stem was found to be well fixed and the taper was having a grade 1, grade 2 damage due to metallosis. So we did not remove the stem, we kept the stem as it is and just the acetabulum revision was done. And these are the final x-rays. However, uh, after three months, uh, once the patient was uh, weaned off all the hip dislocation prevention, prevention protocols, the patient presented with a hip dislocation and uh, so, you know, it was a catastrophic uh, disaster for us. Uh, as uh, Dr. Pradeep sir uh, rightly said that we, uh, uh, we, uh, we did all the possible investigations to know what, uh, what, what was the cause for the dislocation. So, we did a, uh, initially we did a close reduction uh, under anesthesia. And after uh, uh, reduction, we did a stability check under the IITV guidance, which suggested that the hip was unstable at 90 degree of flexion and around 20 to 25 degree of adduction and internal rotation. Uh, CT was done to assess the alignment and position of all the components, uh, but uh, uh, it suggested that the acetabular and the femoral components were within the normal alignment uh, markers. And after all the investigations uh, due to the thorough debridement which we did for metallosis, we thought that the abductor deficiency was uh, pinned to be the main cul culprit for this dislocation. And so we revised it with a dual mobility hip for enhanced stability and the patient is symptom free and doing well at approximately three years of follow-up till now. In the hindsight, uh, we think that we could have prevented this uh, dislocation catastrophe by using a dual mobility hip uh, initially as we had done a thorough debridement and uh, the abductors were quite damaged uh, during the uh, revision surgery. So we thought that we could have uh, avoided this complication and directly use a dual mobility hip. 
so if you see the dislocation uh, burden uh, it is uh, very common after the first revision and the dislocation is the most common reason for a redo revision surgery in approximately one on one in the three cases and uh, as sir uh, pradeep sir rightly said that it is very important to understand and find the cause of the problem leading to the dislocation before jumping in the surgery and to try to correct the dislocation with uh, different uh, implants and armamentarium So, uh, instability is multifactorial, and we need to. Uh, yeah, we we got it. Uh, you have done a wonderful job, and this is ideal yeah. indication for uh, dual mobility. Mm -hmm. Only yeah. one small uh, doubt. Like a portion. Query yes. is uh, uh, whenever you see metal uh, metal ion reaction, you should always change the taper that is a stem. Yes, it is absolute to one of the indication that you must change the taper and you must revise the stem. Otherwise, uh, you will again land up with the because even the taper can lead to metal uh, reaction, alveol reaction. Only taper reaction it can yes. cause. So it is absolutely important that whenever you see alveol, you must, as a rule, change both the stem and the cup. so uh, i completely agree with you sir but because he was a aged male uh, aged patient and uh, on uh, examination we found that it was grade 1 grade 2 damage so we did a ceramic head with a titanium sleeve uh, implant just to uh, maintain or uh, to uh, to not revise the stem but uh, i completely agree that we should revise whenever it is possible fine you have taken a risk thank yeah. you very much thank you good case next uh, Next uh, faculty, please. I think he's a yeah. Can I share? Yeah, Karthik, please go ahead. Okay. So, okay. Okay. Am I visible? Yeah. 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 So my uh, case is a revision THR with the defect uh, augment. Uh, so uh, the gentleman seventy five male. Operated for the right side uncemented THR before six years. Presented with the right hip pain with the limping while walking for eight to ten months at the time of presentation. ESR CRP hip joint aspiration for to rule out the infection was normal. Neural biopsy was done and it was normal. So uh, first X-ray was in, taken in September 2020, and it was shown the acetabulum osteolysis uh, and the proximal femur osteolysis. Sequential X-ray was taken, and in November uh, there is a marginal fracture line uh, in the acetabulum also seen with the proximal femur and the supra acetabulum osteolysis. When patient presented with this, uh, the X-ray was that complete fracture line visible on the acetabulum side with the osteolysis uh, loosening of the uh, acetabulum component uh, and the proximal femur osteolysis without uh, any uh, gross loosening of the stem. So uh, this is the superior acetabulum osteolysis breaking in the iliopectineal line, uh, query transverse fracture, uh, maybe uh, pelvic discontinuity, eccentricity of the femoral head in the shell, uh, suggestive of the polyvar, and the proximal femoral osteolysis, uh, query loosening of the stem. So now, Michael, what next? How to? Uh, so I thought over, and the questions came in my mind looking at the X-ray. what for the investigation should help uh, will help me to give a better outcome how to revise the acetabulum do i need to revise the femur how to deal with the retroacetabulum defect size of the defect how to fill that defect either augment or bone graft bone graft which kind of bone graft allograft or autograft fracture line in acetabulum is there the pelvic discontinuity or something else and do i need the cup cage construct for if it is a pelvic discontinuity so i investigated with the ct scan and ct scan shows that there is a huge uh, uh, defect superior to the uh, native acetabulum and uh, loosening of the cup you can see in the transverse cut there is a huge osteolytic le uh, lesion uh, biopsy was done uh, and it was normal and the 3d ct 3d ct shows the continuity of the posterior column uh there is a ballooning out of the uh, wall but there is not discontinuity of the either column 
so it is not a pelvic discontinuity though sexualization it may be due to the medial column medial uh, quadrilateral plate or medial wall break, breakage and so uh, i go through the literature and search for uh, what what is the base for the defect uh, allograft or uh, augments and uh, there was a, uh, uh, some centers shows very good result with the allograft uh, and some centers showed the average Uh, and question was the uh, old age. Uh, I revise with this. Uh, revise cup. Uh, uh, except the liner, uh, it was the superior uh, liner uh, wear, and uh, cup was revised without any bone loss. And this was uh, this was the video of the uh, defect. Uh, all material was curated. Defect was curated uh, completely. And send for the culture again, and by histopatho again, and the uh, defect after the uh, complete period is the acetabulum cavity with the supramedial defect. Uh, trialing uh, was done with the uh, trial, Timas trial, and uh, this was the stability of the trial cup. Uh, the primary hole was uh, taken between the posterior and superior and the superior uh, corners uh, in uh, diagonal fashion, and uh, this was another case to check the stability of the trial component. You try, you put the trial component, and you try to flip over the trial component in the defect. If it is a flipping over, uh, you might need, uh, uh, you have to reconstruct the uh, defect either with the bone graft or augment. And uh, I used the augment uh, to fill the medial defect, superior medial defect, and along with the Timas cup, uh, ischial screw was put uh, through drilling through the cup in proper direction, and this was the post-op X-ray, immediate post-op X-ray, and uh, this was the six-six uh, post-op X-ray. And this was the latest video of the patient. Very good. Good reconstruction. Any comments, sir? Along with that, probably if you put a graft, it is always better. But otherwise, yes, it was very well done. Yes, sir. I agree. Uh, uh, bone graft along with that augment is. Uh, Is better option. Uh, bone graft is always complementary. Always yes. revision. Uh, Allo graft is a very standard protocol. So you must have uh, uh, known Allo graft, which is approved by most of the people. Tata bone graft is well known, but it is approved, and uh, bone graft is always uh, handy and complementary for any type of exam. So always yes, message bone graft should always be used. Allo graft. Yes, sir. Very good. Thank you. Could put it on the femoral side also, but otherwise it's very nice. Yeah. Yeah. I think okay. Go for the next. Next, uh, Martin. Yes. Yes. I'm here. I'm the, here. You are the next. Uh, Yeah, so we share our screen. Faculty, please. Do you have the slide? Yes. Okay. Very good. Thank you. So it's my pleasure to have another presentation in the frame of this master's course. Revision in total hip arthroplasty: the role of Pilox option heads. So it will answer some of your questions I receive also on the chat box. Again, a disclaimer: I'm still a consultant for Ceramtech. So what is Pilox option? You can see that on this slide on the left hand side. It's actually a system of ball heads going from 28 millimeter up to 48 millimeter in diameter, and is provided with four different sleeve size. S, M, L, XL, in order to adjust uh, leg lengths. Up to statistic of uh, December 2019, more than 800,000 of this system have been implanted worldwide. 
in which situation can you use Bilox option? Actually, there's three kind of indications. Let me start with the left-hand side with the, during a primary surgery. It can happen that during the surgery of a primary hypotroplasty, you have so what you call unexpected taper damage. You can uh, imagine that you have a contact between the retractors or during the trial reduction, you damage the taper of the stem. And then we strongly recommend to not use a standard Biolox ball head because if you have a damaged taper, you strongly reduce the strength resistance of the ball head. And then it's recommended to have a Biolox option system. That's why it's always important to emphasize to keep this protective cap on the stem as long as possible to avoid this kind of damage. The second situation is a situation where you have just a cup revision. You can imagine that the stem is not loose, so you keep the stem in situ. Then you can change during this operation, this, during the surgery, you can change the neck length, you can change the head size, you can upgrade what you call from polyethylene to ceramic or you, from metal to ceramic. Or even if you have an old Bilox 40 ball heads, you can upgrade to the Bilox Delta. Of course, if the patient is showing some Cobacom material allergy, you can also change to ceramic. The third situation is a case of a ceramic implant revision due to failure or fracture of the ceramic, which was the primary reason why the Bilox option system has been developed. So in this situation where you have head fracture or liner fracture, then you have to use this Bilox option system as long, of course, as you want to keep the stem in situ. There's some limitation in what situation you can use the Bilox option system. If you have some minor damage on the taper of the stem, then it's okay. If you have some example like shown here, if it's beveled, flattened, or if it's squashed on the surface of the taper, then you cannot use anymore the Bilox option system with the sleeve because this sleeve will never be fixed properly on the taper of the stem and you have a high risk of fretting corrosion. Here two practical images in a situation when you can use the Bilox option system. On the left-hand side, you see the taper of the stem is still in a good shape, good situation, so you can use it. The right-hand side, you have been flattened on the surface, and you cannot use it. I used to say to the surgeon, if you are not sure, you can use just the sleeve, and you put the sleeve on the surface of the stem. And if you have the impression the sleeve is not well fixed, it is waggling, then it's recommended to not use the sleeve, the Bilox option system, but to exchange the stem, or if you want, you can also use a metallic ball head, but be uh, aware that you have also an increased risk of fretting corrosion because even the metallic ball head will not be fixed properly on the stem. What should be done in case of ceramic fracture? And that's the most important part, finally, of my presentation. You have to perform a thorough debridement, jet lavage, and cinevectomy. It is important because you have to eliminate all the, all the ceramic particles from the capsule. It is easy for the big parts, but as I can guarantee you, it is impossible to eliminate all the ceramic particles. So it's always recommended that after a ceramic fracture to use, from the best point of view from the tabology, is a ceramic on ceramic, or in the second case, ceramic on high cross polyethylene. What you should always avoid is to have a metallic ball head because you cannot avoid to, as I said, to avoid to eliminate this uh, ceramic particle. And if you have a metallic head, you create a grinding machine. And this is the result if you are using a metallic ball head after a ceramic fracture. As you can see in this case, in the case of the male patient, 71 years, a re-revision, and the, the surgeons put the metallic ball head after the fracture of the ceramic ball head. And this is this kind of metallosis appearing. Actually, this is well known since many years. There's a lot of publications out there starting 2003 showing and explaining clearly that after a ceramic fracture, you should not use a metallic head. Because as I said again, I repeat myself, you always have some rest of ceramic particles which create a grinding machine. So once you start with ceramic, you have to stay with ceramic. But we have a solution for that. Let me go a little bit about fretting corrosion, especially with the ceramic uh, Bilox option system with a metallic sleeve. As you know, from the perspective, you cannot distinguish two cases. The technical perspective, you can imagine that the effect of the corrosion if the implant is so strong that you can even have the fracture of the stem, of the top of the stem, and this disruption. That's very seldom. But more critical is what you call the biological perspective, because during fretting and corrosion, you are creating a lot of metallic ions going in the body of the patient. 
And having all these metal particles, metal wet debris, corrosion products to create a metallosis and ALTR, as I dis discussed a little bit with my previous presentation. If you look now from the numbers in total hypatroplasty, following the publications, one to up to 4.2% with metal on polyethylene articulation, you have the cases of uh, fretting and corrosion. Much higher with metal on metal, this is now also well known. It's also one of the reasons why metal on metal has been stopped principally. As previously also explained with the revision that showed a few presentations before me. So the question is, is fretting corrosion an issue for Biolux option system? As you can imagine, SRAMTEC, before introducing this system on the market has done a lot of in vitro testing with the million cycling of testing the Bilox option system to see if there's some wear at the interface between the, step, the, the stem taper and the ball head taper. It was fair enough, good enough to decide that you can go on the, on the market. It was no significant effect on the corrosion. But more interesting is about the retrieval studies. So we have to analyze these studies because finally this is the truth of what's really happening in the body of the patient. So we have to analyze the both interface. You have now a supplementary interface between the head and the sleeve and the sleeve and the stem. This, to my knowledge, up to now two publications, but a bit limitation is the time of implantation because it was not used so long in situ to give a con final conclusion. But here, anyway, some pictures of it. Now it's the fretting corrosion at the inside of the sleeve, that means at the connection between the taper of the stem and the sleeve. So we have this grading, no corrosion, some minor effect or moderate. And if you look the outer part of the sleeve, which is in contact with the ceramic ball head, it was very minor signs of fretting and corrosion. Let me go now to some practical guide to explain how to use properly this Bilox Shopson system, which is finally exactly similar to the system with the primary ball heads. Important is to have always keep your taper of the stem clean and dry. So always you have to wash it and clean it, even if, you are, if it's in a case of revision and you want to introduce another ball head on it, the Bilox Option system or metallic ball heads, always clean and dry the taper. It's important also to have a, what you call a visual inspection of the taper to make sure that there's no uh, damage on the surface of the taper. Again, as I said before, remember the three situations when you can use the Bilox option. If it's during a primary surgery and you see that the taper of the stem is damaged for any reason with a contact with a retractor, for example, then we strongly recommend to use a Bilox option system. In the case of the revision, then you have to make sure that the mounting of the sleeve on this taper is safe and not waggling too much to be able to use a Bilox option system. And finally, you have to fix it. Most of the time you're mounting the ball head on the sleeve on the table, on the surgery table, so it's clean and dry, there's no issue, and then you can mount it directly on the stem. As I said before, if you want to make sure that you can use it, it's one of my proposal, you can use just the sleeve and you try to put it on the taper of the stem to see if it's waggling. And after that, if you say, yes, it's okay, I can use it, please rinse and clean the sleeve to make sure it's also dry and uh, without any damage. And after that, as usual, you have to have a strong impaction on the surface of the bullet by using the corresponding instrument to make sure that you have a safe and tight fixation between the bullet and the stem. This is also true, of course, with the Bilox option system. And now I'm already at the end of my presentation. I will be more than happy to answer your questions. Hello? Yeah, it's a good uh, bailout situation. Uh, frankly, I don't have many experience on this. So, uh, Dr. Goste, do you have any experience uh, uh, it's a wonderful um, idea and it's really coming up. And uh, this is a very important message that whenever there's a, any fracture issue of ceramic, only option, even if metal on metal, if there are any option uh, problem, uh, ceramic head biolex delta is the best option. It is a really scratch proof and uh, is absolutely indicated, I would say, even what previous cases we saw. So metal on metal reaction or any fracture of the ceramic, this is a very good option. And sleeve also, you can put it. And 
wonderful mm-hmm. if the, if martin if they, can i ask a question sure yeah uh, if you have a cobalt chrome stem as a primary stem and your sleeve is a uh, titanium sleeve right so yeah. how, would it be compatible with the old previous cobalt chrome stem which i don't want to revise and i want to you know just change the head and acetabulum so would it be compatible or i can't use it hello dr bende hi how are you fine good. fine yes yeah. it is compatible that's the good news uh, we had that the sleeve is made of uh, titanium vanadium alloy and even though you have different kind of material between between i think that's the basic the, the, the background of your questions different material between the cobalt chrome and the titanium sleeve it's not an issue from uh, just the corrosion point of view the galvanic corrosion because it's very low it's actually the same if you would ask me the question can i put a cobalt chrome head on a titanium stem it's exactly the opposite uh, version so this we have tested that of course with titanium stem but also with cobalt chrome so this is uh, properly adapted to use a titanium sleeve the adv- advantage of titanium sleeve is that during the impaction you have a slight uh, deformation plastic deformation of the sleeve to ensure a good uh, fixation on the stem So the answer is yes. Yes, fantastic Martin it's a wonderful you are really taking all the hip surgeon to a uh, most modern level and everybody is uh, enjoying using uh, Bialas Delta and with the sleeve it will be wonderful. Thank you. Thank you Dr. Mosali. Yeah. I hope to miss you to see I'm I'm waiting uh, you cannot imagine how long I'm waiting to be able to travel again and to see you <laughs> real in life in India again. It's more than yes. one year that we are all stuck at home. Yes. Thank you. It was a wonderful session, and already we have passed the time, so I don't want to waste time, and I hand over to the next session, please. Thank you, sir. A big thank you to our session directors and faculties for their presence and an engrossing session. Moving to session three, case presentation. Merit Orthopedics takes immense pride in welcoming each of our eminent moderators and the case presenter. We have with us as moderator Dr. Deepak Dave, consultant orthopedic and joint replacement at CG Multi Specialty Hospital, Ahmedabad. Dr. Deepak Dave is one of the leading surgeons with more than nine years of teaching experience. He has been invited as guest faculty at numerous associations and conferences, naming a few: ISHKS, ISCA, IOA, Indian Arthroplasty Association, and so on. He has more than ten. national and international publications to his credit dr deepak dave merrill orthopedics welcomes you to master's course kesathon we also have a session moderator dr harish bhinde director joint replacement center for joint replacement surgery lord clinic mumbai he is one of the leading joint replacement surgeon in india with more than 30 years of experience and having performed more than 10000 knee replacement surgeries majorly computer assisted navigation surgeries he has been associated with numerous associations he has been a former president of iaa a former vice president of bombay orthopedic society founding member of ishks to name a few he has several international fellowships to his credit he has various publications and articles to add up to his vast expertise in orthopedic specialty dr harish bende merrill orthopedics welcomes you to master's course kesathon We have Dr. Ben Benia Horia from uh, Romania as session moderator as well. We have with us as eminent faculty. Uh, we have with us an eminent faculty as case presenter, Dr. Sanjeev Jain, senior orthopedic and joint replacement surgeon, Hiranandani Hospital, Mumbai. He has twenty nine years of experience and has performed five thousand surgeries. He has special expertise in computer assisted joint replacement knee hip shoulder and elbow replacement UKR THR by direct anterior approach revision hip and knee replacement sports surgery and cartilage transplantation he has to his credit numerous international trainings and fellowship programs he is a full time review- reviewer at JBJS he has been a pioneer in india to start computer assisted rotating platform flex knee replacement for complete knee bending after tkr dr sanjeev jain merrill orthopedics welcomes you to master's course with this i request our respected session moderators to take up the session thank you
दीपक भाई यू कैन टेक ओवर यू आर देर संजीव जस्ट कैन यू शेयर द स्क्रीन प्लीज यस संजीव that fine yeah sanjeev you have two cases correct yes i do have two cases okay fine so may i go ahead yes yeah please so actually i'm not going to talk too much about the dual mobility uh, uh total hip or dual mobility concept because i'm sure that this must have been discussed but uh, this has been started around 40 years back and the idea was to have a low or no dislocation rate to have an excellent stability and also the low wear rate and of course the great function or range of motion in the hip after the surgery now i have a very limited experience in dual mobility which we have started very recently and uh, i'm showing uh, two of my cases which i have done in last three months of course i have done more than uh, 10 or 15 cases of dual mobility so far so but these are i find as uh, difficult and interesting uh, cases could be so this my first case is 68 years old female she had a left side basi cervical trochanteric fracture which was 2 weeks old she also has multiple comorbid condition also has history of hemiplegia recovered on the same side definitely uh, option of fixation was dicey for us uh, because it was 2 weeks old and this was her x-rays pre operatively uh what we did is we did uh, dual mobility uh, hip system uh, we did uh, trochanteric wiring and we had an excellent result post op we also planned a ct scan uh, prior to the surgery and as you know uh, it was difficult to fix definitely she was old lady with history of hemiplegia on the same side uh, trochanter is completely fractured there so we decided to have a dual mobility and this was her post op this is around 6 to 8 weeks now uh, for the surgery and we could do the dual mobility from the meril uh, metal on poly uh, was the, uh, the the other one and this was the trochanter which we have wired it uh, with the uh, control cable wire uh, from a dupe system she's doing well and she's walking around uh, any discussion on this harish if you would like to have it or dr dabey hello can you go back to the pre op actually yes okay uh so how did you approach the fracture how did you approach the case what approach did you take i did a posterior approach okay okay and definitely it was very easy for uh, me to go uh, from mm-hmm. the back side and mm-hmm. uh, basically take out the uh, whole head from the posterior side okay. sanjeev my question is if this would not have been hemiplegia would have you would you have done the dual mobility see we do not know actually the what are the as such in our hand what are the long term data we have i'm sure that not many surgeon have used the dual mobility in our country sir so we have started doing it and we need to have our own first hand experience but yes definitely she had an history of hemiplegia Uh, uh probably that was one of the reason i have chosen this patient so harish if you would not have been hemi hemiplegia would you have done dual mobility well there is a definitely she is only 68 year old person and uh, normally primary prosthetic replacement primary prosthetic replacement for the uh, intertrochanteric fracture is done only if the patient is very elderly with life expectancy not more than 10 years so these are the people who are 78 80 82 year old with a severe osteoporosis so this patient seems to have very good quality bone you can see the bone is not bad yes. so in that scenario primary <laughs> fixation would have been my first choice had there be no uh, hemiparesis dr sanjeev i would like also to ask why didn't you use a longer stem like a revision stem which yeah uh, this was a very well good fitting stem if you see the length of stem which is fitting here is quite good 
so uh, uh, on the trial even, so we did not use it. Otherwise, we had also kept the option of using a longer stem as well. Okay, very nice. Very nice. Can you go to the next one? Yeah. Next case is an 84 years old male. He uh, had a two months old fracture neck female left side. Again, this I've chosen because of the reason he has a Parkinsonism, he's hypertensive, and this was his preoperative x ray. Two months old, neglected uh, fracture neck femur. And this was the post op. Again, the dual mobility, hep, uncemented stem, metal, and poly with a metal liner. So, the question is, uh, yes. why cannot you do a simple, uh, say, bipolar? Why yeah, you can do it. Harish, 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 you can do it. Bipolar, you can do it. Large ball, large ball arthroplasty, which is as stable as your dual mobility would be. Uh, dual mobility, you have to go and rim your acetabulum, increase the level because if you are done the non cemented stem, I presume the bone quality must have been quite good. Yes, if you can see the cortex is also very good. You wouldn't be putting non cemented stem. And if the bone quality is good enough to do a non cemented stem, why do you have to revise uh, to convert a hip into a you know replaced hip? Why not just do a simple bipolar? You can have a variety of options, Arish. Yes, definitely, yes, we could have done the bipolar. As I correctly said and very frankly said that we need to have a, some very uh, good selected cases like here, the Parkinsonism is 84 years old male to have a, also have a first hand experience with the how the dual mobility works uh, in our hand, in my hand possibly. That is one of the reasons I would like to do dual mobility in a few selected cases. Uh, Dr. Harish, in the primary yeah. cases, do you think that the head diameter would be a consideration uh, to go for a dual mobility to give a better stability in selected cases purely on the diameter of the uh, socket? I Sorry, like, I didn't get like, your question. Like, what do you mean by diameter of a socket? Like, like 44, a small size socket, 44, 46. <laughs> would you consider in selected cases to go for dual mobility where you are mm. not able to use 32, mm. 36? No, if I have to do THR, if I have to do THR for some reason that I have to replace acetabulum and I am not, uh, I don't want to do bipolar, then obviously in a smaller cup, then it is difficult because then you have to have a much smaller head. You may end up putting 28 heads. And oh. if you are not comfortable, then I will go for a dual mobility. There is no question. But these are the small patients. There are small ladies with the osteoporotic bone TC fracture, but they are active. They are not very uh, moribund or they are not very bedridden. And they mm -hmm. are active. So I would like to go for uh, maybe a hip replacement, not a hemi replacement. And because the cup is very small, head could be 39, 40 size head if I use a bipolar. That means mm -hmm. I probably can put cup which is 44 or 42. Then I would go for a these uh, dual <laughs> mobility <laughs> cup. Yeah. Correct. So that is one of the indication what has been suggested in the literature, even one of the recent meeting in the ish they were talking about is that uh, diameter less around 44 or 46. One may think about a uh, dual mobility. And both these cases were having around 40, one was 44 and one was 46. So mm -hmm. that was not the real indication for me to do that. But there was Parkinsonism and old paralysis was my indication for doing that. Mm -hmm. But These are two cases which I have wanted to show. We can have a discussion. I am just stopping sharing my screen. Dr. Jain, would you, just for sake of giving a high range of movements, would you have a dual mobility as your indication anywhere? Not really, not really, uh, not really, sir. Uh, I think that should be the last thing. Just to give a high range of movement, uh, I think if you do a well done total lift, they get an excellent range of motion. So I don't think so. That's in a criteria. So apart from the neurological conditions, uh, what you rightly showed, Parkinsonism, hemiplegia, uh, any other uh, definite indications, Harish, you think in our clinical practice where there is a lot of role of dual mobility, except for the recurrent dislocations or revision cases? 
I have used only maybe a handful of times, less than 10 number. And most of my indication are basically uh, these elderly people where the acetabulum is damaged and bad, then I would do dual mobility. And a couple of times are done in revision cases. Uh, these are the cases where the revision was done for a recurrent revision. So the patient had a primary, then it was revised and the revision was dislocating again and again. So many times these people have the abductors which are not very good. And then you would like to an added assurity, assurity that we have got something more stable in a mechanically more stable than a standard THR. Because here the ball okay. becomes quite large. Yeah. But I haven't got a big experience. I would like to ask the faculties also, when we talk about the revision of a cup that uh, luxates in, that dislocates in a, in a total hip, when do you consider the option of a retentive cup instead of a du dual mobility? Well, if the cup, the reason for revision is something else uh, or is on a femoral side, there is the osteolysis on the femoral side. But usually that will happen following only poly wear. So if you are talking about poly cup, if there is a wear, then I have to revise it. Because many times, a cup which is in position for four, five, six years, just changing the poly and putting a new liner becomes difficult because the locking mechanism of that original cup may not be very good. And many times we may not have that original cup which is put maybe five, seven, ten years ago. The similar implant in the market and a similar insert which is available and made by the company. So whenever there is an acetabular side problem for which I am doing the revision, I would rather revise the entire cup and put a new cup. And revising a non-cemented cup is not a very big problem today because of the explant system which is there. So we can easily revise a non-cemented cup without causing a lot of bone damage. And you can put actually in many cases another primary cup a little bigger in size. And then you can get a much better locking mechanism, a much fresher poly, and uh, probably that will last much longer. So very rarely I have retained the primary uh, cup in a case of revision. So okay. uh, may I just ask all three of you that what is your preference over the constraint liner or dual mobility in a dislocation in revision? Uh, Many times, constraint liner is a very soft option out taken by a surgeon. Uh, all the forces of dislocation will eventually physically constrained by that mechanism and it wouldn't last more than a couple of years maximum. I have seen a lot of patients in the re-revision where constraint liner has been used indiscriminately and these don't last more than. I have not used myself a constraint liner for a dislocating THR yet. Dual mobility, yes, you can have a better logic, but constraint liner is sometimes used in a, you know, as a soft option out, uh, and usually a, it fails. It's a bailout option probably where uh, if patient is not medically very fit, you just really need to do a quick solution, but it's not a permanent long-term solution. And that's, it gives a restriction of movement. Movements that's are restricted. Elderly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. Dr. Sanjeev, uh, yes, I just asked you, if you have an option of putting the screw and not putting the screw for the acetabular fixation in dual mobility, would it make any difference in choice of the uh, particular system where you have option of putting the screw fixation uh, in the socket and no screw fixation in the socket? Would I don't it think so. Difference? Personally, I don't think so because if it's a well-fixed socket and covered completely, I don't think so there should be an issue. No, in India, we have got both the options available. We have got a screwless yes. cup, which has got yes. a fins and a small spikes, which are supposed to get impacted into the socket. The only drawback which I have, what I found with these cups is those fins or those small fins which are there. When you start impacting, one of the you know pin is uh, it touches the periphery of the acetabulum first, and the cup start tilting in opposite direction. And Correct. many times, if you try to put a cup in X orientation. And when you actually put the cup and finally hammer it, it may have tilted in any other direction than what you like by maybe few degrees. If it is 5, 10 degrees, it doesn't matter. But if it can go in a much bigger way, it can be a problem. That issue doesn't happen if you have got a cup which has got a screw fixation. Because then you can cup, put the cup the way you want 
and in addition you can put the screw and then fix it very well yeah you're right as you said we have both the systems available i think couple of systems where we have screw options yeah. available correct but the only thing is if you put a screw option those cups are bigger in size and the metal part is thicker so your internal ball is a smaller size by maybe couple of millimeters the screwless cup are thinner so you end up having a much larger ball maybe by 2 mm or 3 3 2 3 mm more so on paper stability will be better with the screwless cup because they allow a bigger ball to be inserted bigger plastic ball i'm talking about not the internal head hmm. and the hmm. cup with the screw because the screw has to be there in a the periphery they are thicker cup so your internal size of a plastic ball is little it's going to be less hmm. correct yeah. correct <laughs> i think all people should know about this two difference uh, as you rightly mentioned uh, so that people can have an idea uh, when they use uh, these are the two very important points which you have raised the size of the diameter the thickness of the cup and when you need to use i would like to ask uh, all everybody with uh, greater experience if you have encountered this locations on dual mobility cups and what did you do with it well i haven't done dual mobility more than maybe 10 or 12 so i haven't seen my own patient with dislocation yet um i personally don't have any experience of dislocation with dual mobility but i think uh you really need to go to the basics as dr harish bende just rightly said what is the cause of the dislocation i think probably is it the you are not yet dr dipak we need yeah. to really go to the basics of the dislocation rather than uh, blaming the dual mobility i think if your dual mobility is also dislocating there is something wrong um, uh, the neurological problems the weakness of the abductors or the component positioning so we really need to go to the uh, the other causes to find out why it is dislocating the same with me that as harish said the same way thank you i uh, i think uh, dr sanjeev uh, your uh, uh, short message for the dual mobility what we discussed uh, here uh, is there are very specific indications for that use it is really a useful thing uh, but not to be used as a marketing tool in a young people just to get the range of movements absolutely uh, i right. think that's what the yeah, message absolutely is. right absolutely right correct so uh, anything else harish you would like or uh, there is a question on? which has come on the chat box in case of acute dislocation after thr can we just take out the liner and put dual mobility head or we have to change the cup also it's by uh, dr sakib yasin uh, now basically if your thr has dislocated you cannot just remove the liner unless the same company allows you to put a dual mobility on the same thing so if you happen to have the same system which allow either use of dual mobility or a thr liner and there is a system like that in india then you can do that but most of the system i know would not allow you to do it then you have to find out the reason for dislocation and as dr deepak dave has mentioned find the cause is it a soft tissue problem acetabular problem femoral problem a neurological issue and among these four things analyze further and treat the patient changing the liner to dual mobility may not be possible in many of the cases because many systems do not have that interchangeability i think there are no more questions fine yeah i think uh, we already uh, behind the schedule we were supposed yeah. to be between 4 to 4:30 it's already 5:30 yeah. now 5:30 yeah so on behalf of all of us uh, uh, thanks dr sanjeev for uh, bringing up these two cases and generating good discussion on this dual mobility my pleasure and uh, thank you uh, maril good cases yeah yes thank you thank you sir thank, thank you arish thank, thank you dave sir fine all right okay thank you thank you sir thank you very thank, much thank, thank, you, thank you, you to thank you to our eminent moderators
our session directors and faculties. With this, we end day one of Master's Course Kesathon. The sessions were informative and enlightening to us. We are sure all our delegates must have enjoyed this. We thank all our faculties and delegates for sparing the precious time and making day one successful. We had approximately 200 delegates attending this course globally. We will see you again tomorrow at 10 a.m. Indian Standard Time sharp. Day two of Master's Course Kesathon will have three sessions on total knee replacement and will continue till 1 p.m. Indian Standard Time. Till then, this is Priyanka Chauhan. Thanking you once again. Bye and have a great day ahead. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.